I really appreciate your call. Hello. Yeah. Thank you for coming. The, uh, thank you, Cindy. Bye. Thank you, everybody, for coming. We'll get started. The uh, I forgot to bring a bunch of extra printed agendas. Is there anybody who did not see an agenda who would like to see it? I can pass around this copy. Okay. Or we can put it on there. Okay. Maybe Christine could transcribe it to the whiteboard, or Emma could do that. Normally, the ED brings agendas, but this is Emma's first meeting, and and it. Uh, if you saw the one on the email, the only change was public comments were moved to the end so that there would be more time for for them without constraining what the board business kind of stuff that we have to go to. And we added an action item, which is whether the board should resolve to change the date of our actual meeting because we, in order to accommodate one member of the board, we're going to change it to a third Thursdays instead of third Tuesdays. So that will be an action item on the agenda. So... And we don't have a secretary at this time, so I'm going to be describing this at the same time. So I'm going to establish a quorum. And members in attendance, Christine Kelly. Here. Susan Rogers here. Cheryl Rubin. Here. Robert Trent. Here. Paul Champay. Here. And then tonight, uh, Allison Lehman is absent. She has two small children, and one of them is in a school play. And that only happens once in a lifetime. <laughs> so... Uh, and James McCammon had a previous commitment that he alerted me about about 10 days ago. Um, additions or corrections to the agenda. So we're going to go through a little bit of a business here, and then when uh, then they'll turn it over to Christine as a meeting facilitator, and she'll turn it back over to me, and we'll go through some board business, and then we'll do the public comments. And as we're going through the board business, if we are talking about agenda items that you have a comment on, you will be able to address the, uh, us at, at that time that we're talking about it, and Christine will be facilitating that, that process. So to the board, are there any additions or corrections to the agenda? <coughs> Hearing none, is there a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Thank you. And is there a second? I second. Sure. Is that sure? Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? <coughs> motion passes. Is, I think all the board members have had a chance to read the minutes from the last meeting. Okay, are there any additions or corrections to the minutes? I have an addition to the minutes, and that's the uh, action by unanimous written consent without a meeting. Per our bylaws, section 4.12, the board is allowed to take an action if there is unanimous written consent. And two days after the last board meeting, we all voted unanimously to accept Jay Coos's leave of absence from the board on a temporary basis and to then offer Jay a contract as the interim chief engineer so he could be available to, so he could be the person to get the station up and running again. So that was, uh, there was unanimous yes vote on both of those items to approve his request for a leave of absence and uh, contract with him for a period of three months extendable. Excuse me facilitate moving the uh, operations and set up new systems. And so the bylaws provide that uh, all the documentation has to be filed with the minutes of the March meeting, so that's what that is, and so I'm adding that as an addition to the March minutes. Are there any other additions? Do I hear a motion to, uh, pat to approve the minutes of the March meeting? So moved. Thank you, Paul. And is there a second? Second. Christine, all in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passed. Oh, sorry. Any opposed? Motion passed. Okay. And now Christine, a member of our board, is going to uh, facilitate some uh, introductions of board members that we will do and then give kind of an overview of the goals and, and uh, that sort of thing for this evening. Thank you, Matt. Now, <laughs> 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 sorry. That's done. That's done. So, um, I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, my name is Christine Kelly, and I am a board member of NCTV, the Digital Media Center, and have been now for two years. Um, originally, when I was brought on board, um, I was the executive director of the Sierra Mentoring Partnership. So, um, I do want to do some board uh, introductions, but I thought that what would be a nice way to start this evening would be to do some, to come up with some group agreements 
and we all agree how we're going to how we're going to communicate with each other this evening, and 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 establish what <coughs> is it that we really want to have in terms of how we communicate with each other. Um, so. I'm going to actually kind of put it out there a little bit for you guys. And, and for example, my first agreement that I would like to have is that we listen like allies. We're all in this together. We all care about this organization for, for many, many different reasons. So that would be an agreement that I would like to put forward. So would anybody else like to put forward an agreement? I'd like to put it on the board, and then I'd like to get general just sort of buy-in for that. This evening, uh, participate like stakeholders. Right on. Okay. okay. Anyone else? Yes. Only a moderator should be able to interrupt the speaker. Anybody, can everybody agree on that? Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't have the greatest handwriting on the whiteboard. Yes. I'd like to see some two way dialogue instead of um, in a traditional kind of meeting where uh, that's more formal and you have your three minutes and you're talking to whatever the entity is and then they just listen and they're not supposed to comment back or whatever like that. We have some, uh, a lot of issues and, and I think it's going to require two-way communication rather than just one-way communication and uh, and along those lines, I'm not even sure that this is this is a great meeting and a great starting point. But it's not really the meeting that we need. The meeting that we need is more of a brainstorming fellowship, family kind of affair, mm -hmm. where we don't have the trappings of board business and everything like that. So we can really get going on a full range of ideas and solutions to move forward together. But this is a great start, you know, I don't want to get that wrong, but, but I'd like, just like to see two-way communications as much as possible without interrupting each other, of course, and everything. But, but um, yeah. when I, um, Gil and I talked on the phone a little bit earlier and I said to him, you know, I see this meeting as a first step. It's definitely not the last step, and it's not maybe a huge leap, but it's a first step. And so given the constraints, everybody understands that this is a board meeting, we are bound by time. Given those constraints, can we make that agreement, Gil, that um, that, that two-way dialogue um, can be can come up in discussion items and, and, and in, in our agenda? However and it that, manifests itself, as long as it's not just somebody saying something to you and then letting it sit, or there's no... Uh, that, I don't think that would be as constructive. We're planning to... And, and, okay. and so I'm asking you all to put your trust in me as a facilitator um, and because I may have to interrupt the dialogue if it does go get too either too contentious or it goes on and on. So can you all put your trust in me for that? I, I promise that I will that I hold that trust and I hold it very seriously. I trust. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Any disagreements with that? Great. So we will allow for two-way dialogue. Larger lettering. <laughs> Get to move up closer. <laughs> okay, allow for two-way dialogue. Yes. I would like for everybody who wants to speak be able to speak. <clears throat> be a time limit on the, uh, I mean, like if if people start doing two-way conversation and everybody in here, we start doing those type of conversations, I mean, we'll be here till tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. 
So, I mean, I know that there was a, originally there was going to be some sort of limit. I mean, if you start talking two ways, then how much time are you going to have? Like, I know how much I want to say, and, and, <laughs> and you know, I mean, I would, it, I, I would ask, given, set a time given on, that there are a lot of people here, that we try to limit our comments to five minutes. And I think that, you know, that's where I'm asking for that trust, Randy, is just, you know, can you trust when, I, if I have to interrupt at some point because we have to move the meeting, then I, I'll do that. Yes. Do the first two points um, sort of um, make that point? Like, if we're trying to listen, like allies, and participate like stakeholders, wouldn't we want to um, use our time wisely when we're speaking so we wouldn't be like using the whole group's time? That's a great perhaps. Point. That's a great point. That's much too logical. <laughs> yeah. You're way too young. <laughs> we need young people. Uh, I'll make, make comments short and succinct, <coughs> and um, also stay focused on one item okay. instead of trying to cover three or four different points. Okay. Mm -hmm. So stay focused on topic. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. I mean, to, to be able to only talk of one subject on your point, because I have several points. I saw your pick. I read fast. Um, the other, the other rule that I would like to encourage, or not a rule, but an agreement that I'd like to encourage is step up, step back. Is anybody aware of, has anybody heard of that, step up, step back? New dance step? No, step up, step back means people who are normally, people who want to be able to step forward and really speak and have a lot to say, would kind of just consider that, that we really want to be able to hear, as you said, from everyone who likes to speak. And so we would encourage everybody the space to be able to say something. So that's kind of that, you know, those people who are, are normally very uh, much present in a meeting, that maybe they just think about that a little bit internally and allow other people maybe in the audience who are not normally so comfortable with stepping up. So that's what we call a little bit of the step up, step back. Does that sound okay? Um, and uh, the other thing that I would also like to encourage is, and, and again, this doesn't have to be so much of an agreement, but I'm encouraging this, is to use I statements. So when you're talking, instead of saying you, 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 it would be really helpful for the dialogue if you, if you were to use I statements, such as, I feel that this makes me feel this way, as opposed to finger pointing and saying that, you know, that this, this person is, is causing this issue. So can, anybody, can everybody sort of understand why I'm kind of going in that direction? And it, it actually feels really good when you're the person saying that because then you feel like, oh, okay, I, I am really being heard. And the purpose of this meeting is that we're taking that first step and trying to let everybody be heard. And it's a lot of people right now. So we're doing, I hope that you understand that it is the intention of this board to do the very best that they can. So the second thing that I wanted to do was to, um, we're going to go around and sort of introduce ourselves and sort of how we were recruited on the board and why we're here today. So since Allison couldn't be here, she asked me to read this for her, so I'm just going to read this for her. So this is Allison Lehman on why I joined the board. I was asked to join the board to develop stronger connection between the work I do in social services and the Digital Media Center. I agreed to volunteer for three reasons. One, I strongly value public access television and the venue it provides for free speech and public participation. Two, I recognize NCTV as a community jewel and its unlimited potential it has to connect health and human services providers in telling their community story to further the important work that they do. And three, I was excited by the opportunity to develop my own learning and expand my understanding of digital media. So, um, now I'm just going to move to me, and then we'll move around for the rest of the board. So I was originally asked to join the board because of my connection in the field of youth advocacy, and also for my expertise in the field of nonprofit organizational development. At the time, I was the executive director of the Sierra Mentoring Partnership, and I was integr integrally involved with the Center for Nonprofit Leadership, Sage Leadership Project, of which um, the Digital Media Center was a really big part of. 
Um, I agreed to volunteer because I was excited by the vision of a digital media center and its possibilities to build community through public access television. I feel the vision created by the board and the ED and as written in the strategic plan, which I facilitated, is vibrant, vital, and important in today's world. So I will turn it next to Susan Rogers. I think you should stand. Yeah, because your voice protects a little bit better when you stand. <coughs> I'm Susan Rogers. I was on the board of FCAT a long time ago, probably for about a year. And then in 2007, Lou Sitzer invited me to join the advisory board of the Public Education Enrichment Fund, which was the, the group that ran NCTV prior to the Digital Media Center. Um, a lot of people sort of had the impression that Terry McAteer's office ran the TV center, but, but it didn't. Terry was also the president of the nonprofit called the Public Education Enrichment Fund. And so that's, that was the, ent the corporate entity that was actually running NCTV up until uh, the assets got turned over to the media center. So I've been around for about five years, I guess. At first we were an advisory board, and then, gosh, I guess, who could you remember, but it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. There were government representatives and people on the advisory board, and then we became a, a real kind of board of directors. And uh, Lou was the executive director for a while, then Michael LaMarca. And uh, then we started a new corporation because it was kind of weird to have a TV station being run by a group called the Public Education Enrichment Fund, which was also a fiscal sponsor for the Children's Festival, the Imaginarium donation checking account, and a couple other uh, science grant project and stuff like that. So, so that was kind of distracting, and we wanted to focus on, uh, especially after we hired Paul, who has such a wonderful vision. We all bought into that vision in a really big way and, uh, and wanted to just have our own entity running just the TV station and the expansion of, of what we hope to become as a digital media center. So I said yes to Lou back in 07 because I've been involved in media literacy education for a long time. I've gone to a lot of national conferences of teachers and people interested in teaching about media and critical thinking and the construction and deconstruction of messages and this sort of thing. I have a website, medialiteracy.com. And, and I'm, uh, but I'm also interested in Access TV because it really makes me mad that corporate corporations dominate the public airwaves. And public access is the only way that average people can access the medium of TV for getting their message out. And so I think that's really important. It just pisses me off that, that uh, you know, a bunch of old, rich, white guys get to, uh, you know, control what comes over the tube. I think that's wrong. So I've always been very much motivated by the free speech aspects of, of community TV, and, and uh, that was one of my big motivators. Hi, I'm Paul Champay. Um, Lou asked me to join the board back in 2007. Um, my wife and I um, have crewed on a few shows. She's here tonight, Cecilia. Um, she's also produced some shows. Um, and Lou asked me to come on and help with the finances and reporting and kind of get better track of, of where we are financially, and that's basically what I've done. Um, my wife and I moved up here in 2005, and. Coming from Southern California, we had never really seen public access TV. We were really impressed with what it did and, and how everything got got done. And the fact that you could produce shows and, and you know with the local content. Um, and so it's been a good experience being on the board and and seeing the different shows and helping out. So. Hey, I'm Robert Trent. Uh, about a year ago, Susan and Paul approached me um, about uh, opening on a board position. I have uh, about 20 years experience in digital media, I have a master's in instructional technologies and uh, have worked with media literacy and uh, digital video and early adopter of the internet. Um, and so I think that's one of the strengths that I, they saw that I would bring to the table. Uh, I also uh, work uh, diligently in our community to support small businesses and emerging businesses, and that's 
part of uh, the Digital Media Center's plan. Uh, very interested in <clears throat> moving digital media forward in our community, uh, particularly for, I believe, in public access, free speech, and uh, creating a vehicle for people to express themselves and their opinions. So that's why I'm on the board, and I believe that's why I was asked to be here. Thanks. It's a hard act to follow. I'm Cheryl Rubin, and I'm volunteering in our community to be on the board because of, uh, I believe in public access and free speech and creating a dialogue and conversations and giving people opportunities to express themselves. This television station is the only TV station in, in, in the game in our community, um, local. Uh, rather than going to Sacramento, we can actually have a voice locally on television and digital media. And I was asked to become involved because my background, I started in radio and for CBS radio. I worked at Good Morning America, ABC television, worked on Madison Avenue in public relations. And, and then I worked in Washington, D.C. and Sacramento advancing ideas and causes and in nonprofit management and foundation management. And as the TV station was evolving into a media center, I was asked to help build a brand for the organization based on the experience I have and also be involved in helping with fundraising and figuring out who to talk to in our community and leverage resources as best we can. I'm also on the board of the Center for Nonprofit Leadership in which we talk about these types of things all the time. There's a lot of training that goes on through that organization, so I benefit from that and helping apply that to the media center. And I'm just really glad to be a volunteer along with all of you and, and uh, take us to the next level. <laughs> the, the last person who isn't here is James McCammon. He's an engineer at AJA, and uh, so he's been very helpful to us. Actually, he's gotten us thousands of dollars of equipment donated from AJA, and uh, he's, uh, uh, I don't know what else to say, but he's a good guy. <laughs> so I just want to stress again that we are all volunteers, um, that we all are uh, are dedicated to this concept and to uh, the NCTB and to the Digital Media Center um, for different reasons, but we are all volunteers and we've worked really, really hard and it's been a tough transition. I have to acknowledge that. It's been a very difficult transition. Maybe we should so, have Jay introduce himself because he's yeah. on the lead of the Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was thinking too. Um, I was uh, asked to join the board because of my technical background in television. Um, I started in television in the late 60s when there were three networks, uh, no direct broadcast satellite services like DISH or Direct TV, and oh yeah, this thing called the Internet didn't exist at that time. <laughs> so uh, some, some would uh, uh, unfairly brand me a dinosaur, but fortunately uh, I've, I've had the, the good fortune of working for a number of the local companies, including Grass Valley Group, and so I've been really close to new t technology developments. Um, during the course of being recruited to, uh, to join the board, I got to know Paul Minicucci pretty well, and uh, I was really impressed with the vision that he had where um, he was going to use that technology to go from what we're doing now, which is public access television, to developing communities of interest through video on various internet sites. And I found that really excited, exciting and I wanted to get involved with it. So uh, that's why I joined the board. So we're going to move through our agenda, and again, if anybody, uh, so I'll ask you that if you have any comments or questions about the items as they come up, let's let the the, um, the board or the executive director uh, kind of get through their report, and then you can please feel free to ask comments afterwards, and I will facilitate the comments. Okay. Uh, first item on the agenda is the board chair report. I guess I'll stand up. It's a little awkward, but it helps people here. Um, so, board members, you'll see there's an action item on the agenda about changing our regular meeting date to third Thursdays instead of third Tuesdays, and 
I know that uh, it was a, it's always hard to get people coordinated, but uh, uh, it worked for Christine and, and Robert and Cheryl are willing to make it work. So, so uh, we don't have a location yet for May because this room is not available in May. I'm hoping that the conference room or the studio or something will be ready in a month in May, but we will put out the notice to everybody and everywhere of a location for our May meeting. So that will be thurs the third Thursday in May, I think it's the 17th, at 6 p.m. Uh, board development. We had two board members resign a few months early before their terms expired. Stan Lathrop and Judy Nielsen, as board members know, we'd like to fill these seats with producers. It's always been our goal to have producers on the board. It's in the bylaws. You know, too bad we didn't do it sooner, but we're ready to do it now. Um, I have with me all kinds of uh, information on, if we can make these available to anybody who wants to see them. We have, we have what we call a board member commitment, which is a one-pager, but all of these documents are based on uh, prototypes from the Center for Nonprofit Leadership. This is a board member commitment, which everybody signs saying, I recognize that these are my responsibilities and duties and loyalty and uh, you know, ethical conduct, personal development, time commitment, and we, everybody signs those. We have the 13... Are those going to be passed around? Excuse me. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, for anybody who wants one, I brought about 10 or 11 copies. Yeah, why don't we just start these around? And uh, 13 key roles and responsibilities of nonprofit governing boards. This is, this is kind of a wordy, formal document. Uh, pr again, a prototype from Center for Nonprofit Leadership, and it kind of gives you a... a Slightly intimidating, don't be intimidated by it, but a kind of large overview of what boards do. And um, again, I encourage you to like it. If you're welcome to read it, um, I meant to bring these primarily for people, producers who are interested in, in uh, being on the board. And then we have a, a, a draft of what we had started for ourselves. It's kind of a pared down version of the long thing that I just described from CNL our own version of uh, Board of Director Responsibilities for the Digital Media Center. So uh, partic please take one of those if you're interested. Um, directors must commit to help with fundraising, which is our highest priority right now. We have a fund development committee that's been meeting for about a year. And uh, what we could use additional people for it. And also, all of our committees are open to membership to people who are not on the board, and in fact, it's really valuable to have people on committees who are not board members because they bring more perspective and they help spread the workload. It's really hard for a small group of people, even if we get up to 11 or 13 board members, to do all of the work because we are greatly understaffed. You know, we just, everybody's working really hard. And in fact, that's how Jay came on the board is that Lou Sitzer and I first recruited him to be, I remember we took him to Diego's for lunch. He didn't know we had a hidden agenda, but we recruited him to be on the tech task force. And then eventually we got them on the board. So people can be on the finance committee or the marketing and PR committee or the fund development committee, and you don't have to join the board to do that. So anybody who's interested in helping us in that way, please come see me or any of the directors after the meeting. Lou? Uh, it's starting to slowly come back to me now about board membership. As I remember, what are the, it, it, can, it can expand to as many as how many? I think our bylaws say between 9 and 13. Yeah. So, like I say, I have those copies with me that are going around. And then um, we have an official conflict of interest policy. Everybody signs that, all board members. Again, these are adopted after the models of CNL. They are in this binder. I can pass all of these binders around. By the way, we can pass these around. These are all the minutes of our board of directors meeting for the past uh, two years, I think. Our executive director reports. Some of these are missing because there weren't enough hours in the day for me to print them all out, but we'll get them on the web eventually, all of this stuff. And then this has our corporate bylaws in it, our corporate policies, including conflict of interest policy, gift acceptance policy, whistleblower policy, document retention policy, all four of those are basically required by the IRS for new corporations. So we instituted those. And uh, our special event project budget policy. This has our strategic plan in it. It has the copy of our memo of understanding, which is basically the contract with the county of Nevada to run the TV station. And it has a copy of our articles incorporation, our 501c3 tax exemption, and our uh, fictitious business name statement. So, so these can be passed around if people are interested in seeing them. Or 
Please keep the binders uh, inside the room. It might just be better to leave the binders. Okay. If anybody's interested, whatever yeah, you have. Come see afterwards, sure. Okay. Yeah, blue. blue. Is there any plan to post these eventually on the website? Absolutely. Did you say you just started developing in the last two years this fundraising process? There's been a fund development committee in place for a year. For a year. Uh -huh. Okay. What is the URL for the website? Can we, excuse me, can we, can we hold off as, if we go back to, I'm sorry, yeah, if we go back, we, we had agreed that we'd let the directors get through their reports and then, and then we'll ask questions afterwards. That's okay. While Susan is writing, this is the key to the room. The previous occupants left it for you to lock up. I'm leaving on the table here. Thank I have, you. Oh, they have a key. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I have my own. I'll take them both. Thank you very much. NevadaCountyTV.org, it is for now. It, I'll, uh, I'll address the website in a minute. So I've, I've heard that there's a list of creative producers who might be interested in being on the board. So if such a list exists, I'd appreciate it if it could be brought to my attention or anybody on the board. So, uh, and if it has contact information on it, phone and email, uh, what I'd like to do is set up a meeting in the next two weeks with people who might be interested in joining the board or a committee, and we can review, you know, what that involves, if you're interested, if we're interested, and go on from there. Uh, any more comments on No, this? we're not going to comment. Anymore. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Annual meeting of the corporation. Uh, per the bylaws, the June meeting of the board is considered the annual meeting of the corporation. It's where we elect new officers. Presently, we don't have a vice president because Jay is on leave, and we don't have a secretary because uh, Judy resigned a couple months early. I'm kind of serving as secretary because that's what I used to do before I became president. Uh, Paul Champagne has agreed to stay on as treasurer for his final year on the board, so we'll be looking for candidates for the office of president and VP and secretary. Uh, next item. Is James leaving? Just a second. Hold on. Hold on. Oh. <laughs> um, Emma, uh, I met with our interim executive director two or three times, a couple times since she started on March 26. She's meeting the objectives that we set relative to budget adjustments and making recommendations, and you'll hear about that during her report. And Jay will give a report on the status of getting the station up and running and what that'll take, obviously a high priority. Improving communications with uh, our membership and the public, the following will now be posted on our website, and I'm, I, I think this is something that we can have Emma do because she has the skills. We'll have our board meeting date, time, and place on the website. We'll have our meeting agendas, and we'll have our meeting minutes. The meeting minutes will go up after they're approved, so, so they'll always be a month late because meeting minutes are not considered official until they're approved by the board at the next meeting after any corrections or that sort of thing. Uh, we can easily have agendas emailed out to people, to members in advance if people want that. Uh, my hope has always been to have some sort of like constant contact email list where people can choose what they want to get. And I hope we're moving toward that. I've been trying to move it toward that for the last six months, but there's a lot of stuff on my plate with this group. Uh, with a constant contact type of sign up, you can say you want to see an agenda, you want to see meeting minutes, and, and get that stuff mailed to you, or not, depending on how much email you want in your box. So uh, we need something like that to, to keep up communication with our donors, with our government partners. I've, uh, like I say, it's been on my plate for a long time, but I can't, I can't do everything. Um, database issues are complex, and as the board knows, I've been trying to work on that for a long time too. It's got to be something that coordinates with the SEAL so we don't have duplication, but we need a database. Right now I got something started on eTapestry. We need a d database for fundraising. If you don't have a database to help you with your fundraising, then, then uh, it's tough. So um, if anybody here has database experience and is uh, you know, willing to help with uh, data entry or any, any kind of thing like that, I'm really interested in, in, in uh, seeing you. Uh, let's see. So communication. Uh, when Emma or Jay have updates on station operations about when new information that makes a difference to anybody is available, they will have Terry send out updates on that. Website. This is currently our present website address, NevadaCountyTV.org, and as I think you all know, it has been for a long, long time. 
We have the domain name ncmediacenter.org, and that is going to be our website eventually. And I actually have a whole second website built. I built the first one, which is there now, which is the one with the black. But you can't get a lot of stuff on the front page because the photos take up so much space. So there's a second website, kind of pretty much ready to go on Drupal Gardens. Um, and eventually, this will convert everybody over to ncdigitalmediacenter.org. Um, and if there's people who want to learn Drupal Gardens, and you're a good content producer and you write well, and you might be interested in helping with that, please see me. Uh, marketing and PR committee. We haven't met in a few months. But the delay got moved. There weren't a whole lot of messages to put out about what to say, because the delay, move has been delayed. But Cheryl Noble and Cecilia Champagne have offered to help with the grand opening. And uh, obviously the rooms have to be in order and such before we do that. And um, <coughs> so hoping that we can identify somebody to be a good chair for the marketing and PR committee, because it's hard for me to chair that and, uh, and be the webmaster and the database person and the board chair and all those other things. <laughs> so that is my board report. So um, what we'll do is we'll open it up to questions about the board report. Oh, about the board report? Yeah, mind. Just I'm specifically scared. about the board report. Okay. Are there any questions about the board report specifically? Great. Okay. If not, then we're going to move on to um, Emma um, Santa. I have a question. Sure. When you say that you postpone the minutes a month later, but yet you're talking about accessibility, uh, waiting a whole month later, getting yesterday's news, 30 days later, we're, you know, with media. Why couldn't we have access to those minutes right after you have that, even if it isn't approved, and say these are unapproved notes? Well, Bill, is there any problem with because that? I, because I, I think that part of the, there's a big problem here in lagging information. Well, and people are welcome to attend our meetings, but I'm going to ask Bill Neff, who is a... Uh, on the board of Center for Nonprofit Leadership and has a lot of experience with nonprofits and processes and correct procedures and stuff. And yeah, I mean, a month is simply because the board doesn't meet again for the next month, but why you don't publish draft minutes is because people who are quoted in there or statements that are made, that person has the right to say no. I said it this way or you forgot something or whatever. So until there's a chance for everyone who is in the minutes to comment on, to make any suggested changes, and so on. Uh, you, it doesn't go to approval, but once it goes to approval, then it's in the public domain. And the month is simply, normally boards don't meet much more than once a month, so that's why it takes a month. I mean, if you met every week, you would have draft minutes for a week, and then you would, would uh, adopt them, and then it would be available. That's a good question, Adele. We are a corporation. And there's certain procedures we have to follow for corporate. No, I mean, I just just thought since we, you know, we're in instant information or whatever, and um, I, I mean, I don't even know why it couldn't even be a place where you guys pass your emails to each other and just okay them, and then it be sent out faster. I mean, I mean, I understand this is standard standard procedures. But aren't we here also as a group of people looking at a lot of standard procedures and wanting to improve on some of it? Yeah, and you still have to follow the rules, and people are welcome to come to our meetings yeah. and hear what no, we're no. saying at the time we say I'm it. just asking yeah. questions. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm not I, trying to change policy without, you know, yeah. it just It just would be, yeah, I just, it, it, this is standard best practice, and so the, we, that is one of the things that we have tried to do as a board is adopt standard best practices. So that's the reason. So I just had two really quick questions. Sure. Um, basically, what if you could, would it be possible for the board to approve the minutes like within two weeks, or is that against, or is that impossible for the board to do? Again, it, it's then it would be email, encumbering yeah, and time emailing, time and it's much better to be able to be there in person so that you can really get. As and Bill was saying, sometimes <laughs> there's quotes that have to be, and it's much better if that's a face. So the second face question face. is, um, what about multimedia being given out to individuals the next day? Um, I, uh, you know, again, I think Such that... Such as audio recordings or video recordings. Would that be inappropriate? Um, no, because I think that, you know, for example, the um, county meetings are, are live, are live cast. So, I mean, our, our meetings are open to the public, 
but they they wouldn't just be they, they, it just wouldn't be our official minutes. So sure, it's sure. absolutely it be, fine yeah. for you know for our meetings to be out to the public because they are open to the public, but it just wouldn't be the the corporation's official minutes. I guess that sparks. I'm so sorry. It sparks the third question: Is there a way to maybe make it the new campus like a little spot where anyone can go and look at the media from the, the most recent? board meeting, like just make it a folder on someone's desk or something, or a folder on the website you could go to. I'm sure we can take like it into consideration. Super easy, especially if you're reconsidering doing the design. Yeah. I mean, and we'll, they can we'll, be uploaded we'll to YouTube for all I care. Yeah, yeah exactly. Sure. Randy. Uh, I was, I don't know if this is in the right spot to ask this, but is, does this board operate under the Brown Act? No. No, it doesn't. Okay, I'm just asking. The board does not un operate and you're, under Brown You're uh, saying that it, as far as you know, it shouldn't have to, right? No, no it, it does not have to. Okay. I think the electronic recording is a great idea because minutes don't show uh, uh, intent, tone, or uh, positions that, that just words on a paper do. Mm -hmm. um, it's not that all the members are going to be interested in every issue anyway. Mm -hmm. There might be one issue that they want to know how the board voted or something like that. Obviously the best case scenario would be for all of us to get together every month. I mean, I don't know how many people you've had at your other previous board meetings, but it's probably yeah, not yeah. been this kind of a turnout. No. <laughs> where, where you have this much members. We're going to have to get a bigger room. <laughs> and, and to dovetail on what Susan said, the work of the station is uh, you know, she's a tough taskmaster, mistress, and um, there's so many things to do that this is the kind of involvement we really need on an ongoing basis to not only support the board, uh, and from what I'm hearing, you know, you're very genuine about why you're here uh, so far, uh, but to support the board and then have the opportunity to be on those committees and everything that you're talking about. So really, it, it's to everybody's advantage to be here every month. But, yeah. but, but some kind of recording or whatever that we could have our hands on to, or uh, whether we put it on the government channel along with our other meetings that we do, the city council and the planning commission and everything like that, might be good for the public as well, for them to hear and see and participate. That's great. I think it's a great idea. I'd like to say that that, that is all great. Our part-time ED's got a lot on her plate, and if someone would volunteer, or you could have a team that would trade off volunteering to do the taping and make the video and upload it or whatever, that's the kind of support we need. You know, we've got so many agenda items, each of us, on our plate, that having one more thing to try and figure out who's going to come, when they're going to take you know, it's like, this is where we need, this is what you guys do. Yeah, that would be great. So, um... With that, we're going to move on to Emma's report. Should I stand also? <coughs> I think it's just easier for people to see you. Sure. First, I'd like to say thank you for everyone for coming. It's really nice to actually meet people. I've been working in a small room surrounded by boxes for the last few <laughs> weeks, so it's nice to see the face of NCTV and Nevada County Digital Media Center. I wrote my executive director's report specifically to the... Yeah. The items that I was hired to do. So if there are, there may be some other questions that are not answered in this report. But the first thing is the operations update. We're currently operating in two locations. The core of the station is still at the armory building across the street. And Terry and Carolyn are continuing to staff over there. They're opening it to public Monday through Thursday from 1 to 5 for drop-offs or questions. Um, programs are still going. If you drop something off, it'll still be scheduled right now. There's no delay in that at this time. Um, and equipment checkouts will hopefully resume shortly. We have to find some of the equipment in the boxes that we still have over there at the Grass Valley Group, but that's the challenge at the moment. But as soon as we can get our hands on that, we'll go ahead and resume that. Currently, it'll be at the old location. We'll be able to check things out by advanced appointment at this point. Um, there are a couple of items at the Grass Valley Group that are still being addressed operations-wise. One is the Dropbox location for DVDs. We don't have one currently in place. An outside phone also to reach the studio after hours. They do lock the front doors at 4 o'clock is when they are no longer staffed. So the only way that you can get in is by calling someone on the inside to come and let you in. Um, we are also have uh, opening staff meetings on a weekly basis, which is, uh, which is kind of nice because we're all very discombobulated at the moment. 
regarding a policies and procedures update. I met with the Grass Valley Group facilities manager, John Larkin, and it became apparent to me in reviewing the tenant landlord contract that there are some things that will need to be added to the member policies and procedures. Um, most notably, for unfortunately, there are no pets allowed in the building, and I know that that will impact some shows. So we'll need to work out some alternatives or make special arrangements in order to make that happen. I'd also like to update on some of the grants that we currently have. One is I met with Penel Curtis regarding the California Arts Council grant, and it is almost completed. And I will be meeting with Paul later to assist with the cultural data input that's required as part of that. I also received an update on the Community Voices project from Pinnell, and that appears to be on track for completion by early June, and I still have to get in touch with Larry regarding that. There was some concern that the funding received for the project was inadequate based on the scope and the requested quality. So one of the things that I'm looking at and going back and researching is what are the standard uh, services that we offer as the digital media center for videographers and how do you incorporate that into future projects so that we can compensate people appropriately. I'm also in the final stages of writing a grant request from the Karis Foundation regarding citizen journalism. This impacts our new edit bays that are going in and some of the training that we'll be doing for community people. And this is going to be in the amount of between $5,000 and $7,500. And that will go off this week. And I'm still looking for other types of funding. For the fiscal and budget review, I met with the finance review committee and we discussed necessary budget adjustments before we get our next influx of money from peg, sta peg stations. And there are key uh, deductions included um, reductions in expenses in office supplies, phone systems, broadband needs, travel, entertainment. Some of those were completely scratched. And there were also some adjustments to personnel. We did have some key increases that were unaccounted for in the budget previously. One of them is the fact that we are now paying rent on two locations. And that is an amount of $1,281 plus utilities. That was a significant increase. Um, and I'm also happy to say that we were able to put in to the budget an independent contract with Randy uh, to help us facilitate the rest of the membership services and finishing up the one-man studio so we can get those live as soon as possible. The total reduction in the budget for between April 1st and June 30th is a total of 22%, and that's a total of $9,424.60. So that's what that was. And the last thing was facilitating the move. Uh, it's going to be occurring in three different phases. The first one is moving over the core, a piece of station equipment over to the Grass Valley Group so we can complete that. Uh, currently, we are waiting for approval by the Public Utilities Commission for the California Teleconnect Fund. That is written into our contract with Comcast that we will not put the Comcast fiber drop in until we've received approval on that. The second application had been completed on March 15th by Paul and Cesar Jana. Our, he is our contact at Comcast. And we received a formal receipt of the application on April 5th. And the letter indicated that it could take up to 60 days for it to be approved. Um, the military, the landlords over there have been advised and they are okay and have been accommodating with the extra needs. And we will see if we're able to move that up. I did draft the letter this morning that I sent to them. Uh, indicating that we would like it to be expedited regarding all these circumstances. So hopefully that will help with the situation. The second phase of the move is actually going to be restoration of all of the member services. And this is actually going on concurrently with the, all of the stuff with Comcast and all the technical stuff that Jay will be speaking about. It includes mostly the setup of the community room, the editing bays, and the one-man studio. So we can actually invite people to come over, and I won't be so lonely anymore, and that will be nice. <laughs> and I'm hoping that that will be ended at the, completed by the end of May at the very latest, or I'm sorry, the early May. And the last phase is actually the studio. It is currently on hold. I am waiting for some quotes on the, different, uh, on the lighting grid, which needs to be put in. And there will be a meeting tomorrow afternoon of the people who are coming together to put the studio together we'll be able to hopefully determine at that time how long it's going to be until the studio is up and running and we're fully functioning. And uh, again, unfortunately, I see the estimated date of completion at this time is late May and early June. And that completes my report. So are there any questions as they directly report, pertaining to Emma's report? Yeah. So Emma, um, yes. for the um, grant of the Cherish Foundation, yes. when is it going to, when are they going to decide on that? When is the grant going to be awarded? My understanding in, our per, in the particular one we're going for is that it's a rolling grant application mm -hmm. and that it can be approved as easy as two or three weeks and that we could receive a check in as little as one week. 
And what amount was that for? In between $5,000 and $7,500, I'm finalizing the amounts on some of the Edit Bay equipment now. Yes? Uh, at the beginning of your report, you mentioned there, there was, was missing yeah. equipment, or you didn't have the organization set in place that so you couldn't find it. Why did that happen? Wade, you've been in the gold room. <laughs> that beautiful room at the beginning where oh, everybody dropped. Room. That's yeah. where it is. So that's the room. Yes. yes. So you were there helping us move some of the items out. The beginning room had become packed with all of the items that we moved over there. It was completely inaccessible except for the two feet in front of the door. So moving all of those things out and getting the pieces in their proper location. And as soon as we get that done, that's when it'll resume. Well, why, my question was, why wasn't their organization set in place so that wouldn't happen? I believe a lot of that had to do with the weather and the volunteers we were able to get in and just how everything came about. Okay. Uh, I think it was not something was that was done. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it, it wasn't intentional. It was a matter of opening the door and going, oh my goodness, how can we manage this? So that's what you guys have been helping with. Excuse me. I think that people need to be called on. Yeah. If you have a question, please raise your hand. That would, that would Let be great. Let our facilitator <laughs> call on you. Robert, you already had a question first, and then I'll go to you. Don. Yeah, I actually have a couple of questions. Um, when you talked about the uh, budget reduction of 22%, was that a, a goal that you tried to reach, or was it you just kind of made as many cuts as you could and it happened to be 22%. I, mean, I came to the fund development committee meeting, and that was one point where it was stated that if I could make cuts between 50 and 25%. 15. Uh, 15, 15. sorry, 50. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 15 and 25%, when we looked at some of the numbers, it ended up that this was the case. There were definitely some things that we didn't need. There was, like, water or travel, entertainment. Obviously, we're not doing any of that in the next next few months. Uh, that was an easy part to cut. It ended up coming out to 22%, which ends up being beneficial because of some of the unforeseen things that are still not in the budget. For example, some of the locks on some of the doors, okay. and there's there continues to be things that pop up that we need to pay for. One part was a $1,000 permit for the building that was not included in the budget. And so this gives us just a little bit of extra room for those next few months for these unexpected surprises that keep on popping up. One other thing, um, I'm trying to get a better sense of the the move, yes, and the um, with the expedite, expediting with for the uh, with the PUC. Mm -hmm. So that if that's it could take 60 days, and that's June, and we have to be out of there by May. There could be like a two week period or so or longer with our conversation and what type of what type of like operations are in jeopardy with our with conversations that? with Comcast and the PUC it does appear that we will be able to get expedited on this uh, what will happen at the time of, of it being expedited is then it will take several days to review a contract that then needs to be signed and sent back. It'll take a week for Comcast to put in the drop, and that is, is fluid depending on when we get that approval. As soon as we get that approval, then we'll look at what the date is and, and how we're looking. Originally, I was told 30 days. It looks like a much better window of average of when we should be approved. What that does is then we have the date when we're going to be able to move and we can look at services. We have the key pro devices, and correct me if I'm wrong, Carolyn, uh, that the that, that will be able to do some looping content while we facilitate the move and as soon as that looping content will cover what's going on air and Jay will have to possibly discuss uh, how that works a little more, but then we'll be able to resume regular programming after that. And we'll be able to time that in between our government contracts and the other things as best we can. So we'll know a little bit more as that happens. May I ask a follow-up question? Mm -hmm. So just I'm, I'm understanding that, that then we will continue to have our government program fulfill our obligations with the county without any downtime? Because that, that is an important obligation. Just, do we know what that circumstance is going to be? 
at this time, we're looking at the calendar for all of the government meetings and finding the window, a primary window and a secondary window after the 30-day date to find out when is the best one to move. So there is limited. There is a possibility. Uh, I think it's very minimal at this time. And at that point, we'll look at alternatives on how we can uh, address the situation. I don't believe we'll have any issues with not showing that government programming. It's just a matter of how we will go about it. Thank you. And obviously, any government partners will get plenty of advance notice if there's any interruption. Thank you. Robert, did you have another question? No, I'm good, thanks. Okay. Adele, did you still have a question? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to understand a little bit about this move. And I'm not talking about the last minute move with all the boxes or whatever, but how long it has actually been in play. Because my question is the fact that we have, with Comcast, a peg. We have public education and government. So when you're talking about fiber optics, we have all three. So when you're talking about our government commitment, we also have a commitment to the public, to the education part. And we need all three of them, and they're not supposed to be intermingled. So my question to you is, when did we start planning for this move? Because I perceived it as back in 2011. And here we're moving into 2012. And it doesn't seem like it's been moving very gracefully and even efficiently. And it seems like there's been a lot of, you know, lack of funds or fundraising. And, I, and the board, who I believe is supposed to be here to do outreach and fundraising, I just haven't seen it. So we're, um, those are probably two different topics, if you'll okay. agree that those are two different topics. And what Sorry. I'd like to do at this point is address the questions of the move. And probably the person to best address that would be you, Susan. Can you address that? I'll try. Okay. Um, and really, it's really informative to go back and look through minutes and executive director reports. And I'm hoping like by the end of next week I can get them up on the website. Um, because it, it actually goes back to 2010 when I saw something in the minutes where Paul reported that he'd talked to Dave Perillo and maybe it would happen in like spring of 2011. Grass Valley got delayed because they were trying to sell the company, as you may remember. And so Perillo was delaying us because he couldn't make any commitments because the company hadn't been sold yet. I can't remember the dates very well, but then finally Dave was in a position where he was able to start on talking about an agreement with us. And so he and Paul started talking, and, and we thought, well, let's look there. We looked around at a couple other places. Paul, at the direction of the board, Paul considered some other facilities because we weren't sure that that was the very best. And after a month or two of that, Paul's recommendation to the board was Grass Valley was the best option. Part of that was because Dave Perillo was personally committed to us. And uh, I think the contract with Grass Valley was signed around September, October, but don't, don't quote me. Yeah, Is that what you remember? Yeah. OK, yeah. Uh, again, it's, it's in there. And I'll have that stuff on the website. Um, after that, really, that, those operational kinds of issues were staff issues. The board doesn't. The board relies on the people that we had on the staff at the time. You know, Paul is the executive director, and uh, he was pretty much in charge of all of that. And I can't remember all of the various factors that went into it, but I think it was November. Maybe you remember when we got the news that Dave Perillo had been um, not with Grass Valley anymore. And that threw a, uh, a giant kind of clinker in our plans. Um, because then suddenly the ground was shifting with them. We already had the contract signed. And, and, and things changed kind of dramatically. We didn't have, we lost some time in terms of even, I think it took a month to even figure out who we could talk to over there. Who was the new guy? When was he going to arrive? When could Paul meet with him? Um, so that slowed it down. Um, if any other board members can remember factors as to why, you know, why yeah, it's all if, took so if, long, if, if I might, Susan, the the other little monkey wrench that got thrown into the works was, uh, I believe we had budgeted thirty thousand dollars for tenant improvements, anticipating that we might overrun that and spend as much as forty thousand. So it was kind of a a fudge factor of spending as much as forty thousand. We went to. Grass Valley Group's recommended contractor, and his first bid was ninety thousand dollars. Ninety-seven. 
was it 97? I knew it was 90 something. It was way, way out there. So um, uh, Paul contacted several other contractors. And we ended up with a contractor who did a very good job, but even um, with cutting as many costs as he could, the bill was sixty thousand dollars. Okay. And the other key date that I, I had to look in my calendar to see, um, there was a walkthrough of the the facility after the tenant improvements had been made. They weren't complete, but they were substantially complete. That was February tenth. So there were some additional things that had to be done in order for us to take occupancy. And to the best of my recollection, we weren't ready to even start gradually moving stuff over there until March 1st. And my last part of my question on Comcast, when you're asking for the approval from Comcast, and that's going to be in 60 days, does this mean that if Comcast for some reason doesn't like our location, at Grass Valley Group, which doesn't really offer us a lot of public access, I mean, for the public, you know, because it's so controlled. Um, does that mean that then, once again, we might not end up with a studio and we might not further this process? No, I don't believe from the contracts no, no. that I have seen already and, and have been in discussion with them, I don't think that's in any jeopardy whatsoever. They are actually very excited and interested in putting in the fiber optic cable there. Let, let me elaborate on that, uh, and, and this is really compli complicated, so I'll try to boil it down to its essence. Um, there is a provision in the franchise agreement that says that if uh, we wanted to have a new drop for the fiber services, the INET and our fiber to, uh, to Comcast, we needed to make a formal request of, of Comcast. And we did that, uh, my God, I think it was in the middle of last year. And we got a ridiculous quote back from them. It was over a quarter of a million dollars to put a drop in at Grass Valley Group. So my comment to Paul was, well, it sounds like they're saying, no, we don't want to do that. So uh, we started exploring other ways that we could do what we needed to do, up to and including having our on-air operations over at NU and controlling them remotely from Grass Valley Group. Well, in order to do that, we need a lot of bandwidth. So uh, through a long series of, of events that I don't need to go into, we managed to get in touch with uh, this Comcast rep, Caesar, that uh, Emma mentioned. It turns out he's with a different division of Comcast than the one that handles the cable TV stuff. And he was salivating at the notion of being able to pitch his division in Comcast to put fiber back in that complex because there are so many potential customers back there. We were salivating at it because we were looking at about $5,000 a month for broadband services from AT&T. And the kind of figures that that uh, the Comcast was talking about would be a monthly fee of a fraction of, of the AT&T. So Caesar successfully pitched his, it's called the Metro E division. They've installed a lot of broadband around this community because AT&T has been gouging commercial customers for a long time. So Comcast made the commitment at no cost to put fiber back in that in that complex. Once that happened, we got the county involved to revisit this notion of having the other fiber services that we've currently got over at the armory relocated. And we managed to put that together. But in order for that to actually happen, actually they've done a lot of the work. The fiber's pulled into the, to the Grass Valley Group building. There's some splicing out here on Zion Street that has to be done. And they're not, Comcast is not going to do that until this, this uh, it's called the California Teleconnect Fund. It's administered by, by the PUC. And basically what it does is it allows us to qualify for a 50% discount on our monthly broadband charges. So as Emma mentioned, that was written into the contract. So, And I'd like, to, I'd like to add to that. We protected ourselves 
we knew that we couldn't afford the full freight from Comcast. So when we when we directed Paul to have the contract with Comcast say that the contract is not effective until and unless we know we can get the PUC discount. Well, the whole thing got hung up in the PUC, and so that's also contributed a lot to the delay because we can only afford it if we get, and we, we qualify, it's like a lot of stupid... But the upshot of all of this, Adele, is that Comcast has actually run the fiber. They've got a spur now that goes down Reward Street and comes in on a service road into the uh, uh, into the utility building on the Grass Valley Group <coughs> campus. And they pulled a lot of extra fiber in there, anticipating that Grass Valley Group would buy services from them and that the other tenants back there in the in the industrial park would, would buy services from them. So uh, I think we're, we're justified in being pretty confident that they're you know they're happy that they've that they're going to recoup their investment eventually. Okay, I, 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 I think that does everybody. Okay. Yeah, I think we need to move on. If, if anybody, okay. So um, I think we're going to move on to uh, now. It's it's your floor, Jay. Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> Gee. Um, we've talked around uh, a number of the things that are in my report, but. Uh, so I'll, I'll be brief, but I'll, I'll try to add to some of the stuff we've already talked about. Um, there are really four main subsystems that are involved in the, in the media center's technical facilities move. One is this on-air, um, we call it ingest and playback, the stuff that is still sitting over in the armory. The other is the edit bays that many of you who are involved in editing and producing programs have used. There's the one-man studio that uh, was a relatively new development that Randy built over at the Armory. And of course, there's the main studio. So ingest and play out is our number one priority. We've got to get that up and running. Uh, several reasons. It's our main source of revenue. We have contractual obligations to Comcast and to the county. It's the most complex subsystem that we've got to move. Um, and the whole thing is paced to a very large degree by this connectivity issue and the uncertainty of the date when it's going to cut over. Now, I, I like to think in terms of metaphors. So we've got a sailing boat, not a sailing boat, but let's say a yacht. And we need to change the engine. And we've got to change it while we're at sea. <laughs> and so uh, we're going to be able to minimize downtime, but we're not going to be able to eliminate it because there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, one of the things that uh, this tech task force that was mentioned earlier, and I, I'll tell you who was on that. It, it, it was me, uh, Paul, uh, James McCammon, the AJA engineer who was a member of the board. Uh, Randy has sat in on the meeting. Steve... Uh, Hurley in the back of the room there. Steve is our, our, our guy who knows networking. Uh, and we've had, we've had other people on and off that committee. So we've discussed this move now for over a year and what we want to try to accomplish. One of the things that has been a goal of mine and the, and the tech task force bought into it is the system that is currently over in the armory has been in place since 2005. There are two video servers over there with spinning disks in them that have been spinning continuously since 2005. One of them kind of bit the dust about six months ago. Fortunately, it was our production server, so we, we could defer trying to replace or repair it. Our on-air server is, is working, but it's real quirky. I've spent a lot of time over there at night and on weekends uh, trying to resuscitate it after it's gone south. That's the bad news. The good news is um, Grass Valley Group has surplused a lot of equipment and we've got, I think we've got three, maybe four servers of the same vintage that have been used primarily for training. So they're very low miles, they're, they're, you know, they're far more robust than what we currently have over there. So. I'm going to be able to very shortly now start building up bits and pieces of the, of the on-air operation over at Grass Valley Group. But there is equipment at the armory 
that has to move in order to be incorporated into that system. That's the, the reason for my metaphor about changing the engine in a yacht while you're at sea. So what we've done to mitigate the uh, inevitability that the stations will see some downtime is we've got these uh, small disc recorders that uh, uh, Carolyn has been working on laying off material on these. So we'll be able to set up a, we, we've, we've got a strategy for maintaining a program feed while we tear equipment out of the armory and move it over to GVG. But it's, um, it's frustrating because of the uncertainty of when Comcast is going to do the cutover. Obviously, as we get further into this hopefully expedited 60-day process of the PUC thing getting, getting approved, we'll know better what that date is. Um, in addition to using new equipment, or newer equipment in that uh, on-air uh, ingest and playback system, um, there are a number of things that we're going to do to simplify the design of the system. The system that's over over there right now in the armory is nearly impossible to uh, troubleshoot efficiently, and once you have found the problem, it's even more more difficult to to repair it. So the new design is going to be greatly simplified, and we'll we'll make that uh, it, it'll be more reliable. It'll be it'll be much much better than what we have over in the armory. Um, the second subsystem, second set of subsystems I'd like to talk about are the edit bays and the one-man studio. And because those are islands that don't really connect to one another or to the outside world, um, we've got a lot more flexibility as to how we work on those. Carolyn has taken the lead to, uh, to set up the new edit bays. Randy's taken the lead to uh, set up the one-man studio. And when those two subsystems are completed, we'll be able to resume post-production and what I call light live production. We'll be able to do promos and talking head type things and everything. As Emma mentioned, the very last thing to come online is going to be the studio. The reason it's going to be the last thing is because it's more complex than those islands that I mentioned. It involves some major construction effort. I'm looking at uh, Michael here uh, in, uh, you know, thinking about hanging the lighting grid, getting the electrical distribution in for the lighting system and so forth. And I think, as Emma also mentioned, there's a group that's going to be meeting over at the new facility tomorrow to discuss that. I, I kind of got tired of people asking me, when's that going to be done? When's that going to be done? And I said, well, I don't know because I don't know what it is. So I talked with uh, Terry and with Carolyn, and we decided to meet with some of the interested parties. Gil's going to be there, for example, and we're, we're going to try to, to define what needs to be done in the studio space to make it usable. Um, now, insofar as the, the video production part of the studio, we don't have a firm engineering design for that subsystem yet. Now, I'm sorry to say that. Susan mentioned Dave Perillo. When Dave Perillo was still at Grass Valley Group, there was a lot of dialogue between Dave and, and, and Paul Minicucci and talk about we're going to get HD studio cameras, we're going to get a new switcher, we're going to get all this, we're going to get all that. His advocacy was very, very tantalizing, but he's out of the picture now. So we don't know what we're going to get in terms of new equipment. So. We don't want to just take what we had over the, the armory and just move it over intact, just like we didn't want to do that with the on-air operation. We want to make improvements, but until we can determine uh, what kind of new equipment or newer equipment we can beg, borrow, or otherwise uh, obtain, uh, we really don't know what kind of a system that we're going to be able to to build there. So the biggest question mark is hanging over what the studio is going to look like there. My ultimate bailout plan is we've got this thing that we bought last year. 
two years ago called the TriCaster. It's a studio in a box. We can do live production. Once we get the lighting grid up and get the, uh, the, the power for the lights in the studio, we can do live studio production using the TriCaster. So uh, stay tuned on that one. So then you would still have a studio? I don't. Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I just want to remind everybody, please, that we just stick with our agreements and please, I know it's hard. <laughs> I get it. Okay, so I, I, I'm about done here. I just want to summarize real quickly. So the biggest issue, the biggest question mark right now is, is the issue of connectivity. Not if, but when. You know, I mentioned earlier when I talked about why I came on the board, uh, this prospect of being able to go from a peg station to someone else, uh, to, to a digital media center that also does develops these communities of interest by pushing video out on the web, that requires a lot of internet bandwidth. So we, we didn't have enough internet bandwidth in the, in the armory to even think about doing that. So this issue of connectivity is critical. Uh, the availability of new equipment. Uh, well, um, one thing that uh, has been a, a bit of a stumbling block for me is that in order to start building the new ingest and play out system at Grass Valley, I didn't have enough equipment racks. Thanks to Terry. Terry, I don't know whether you got the news or not. But Terry sent me uh, an email that she got from the Bay Area Video Coalition. They're having a big garage sale. I bought two equipment racks today for 300 bucks a piece. <laughs> it's a pretty good price. Um, the other thing that I'd like to mention, some of you know about this, but I'm, I'm making my, my living as a consultant now. One of my other clients, I made a commitment to him earlier this year uh, to run his business while he and his wife went on vacation. Well, they went on vacation, and I don't want to go into great details, but uh, uh, she developed some health problems. And so she ended up in the hospital, had surgery and everything. They're stranded where they are now, and by the way, where they are is Hawaii, but you know, you don't want to mix the word Hawaii and hospital in the same sentence. Anyway, long story short, uh, they should have been back a month ago. Hopefully they'll be back within the next week or so. So I'm trying to trying to juggle my responsibilities at the media center and with this other client. And hopefully that will that problem will be rectified in another week or so, and I'll be able to devote full time to this project because I really want to see this happen. Thank you all. Yes. So are there any questions that are directly related? To Jay's report. Yes. What sort of downtime do you expect with the system? Like how many hours? Depends on what you mean by downtime. Like was that Clinton asking enough? Sitting in our yacht, not sailing. <laughs> <laughs> using using the Key Pro disc recorders. Here here's how that's going to work. Um, our connection to Comcast over in the Armory is one fiber. Okay, so when we make the decision that we're going to start tearing that system down and migrating equipment from that system over to Grass Valley Group, it's a simple matter for us to wire the key pros directly to the, to the device that feeds the fiber. So we're talking about something that could be done in an hour in the middle of the night. Nice. We, put the, the, you know, we put the media in the, in the playback devices and we run them now. People, any, anyone who, who has nothing better to do and would watch our station for longer than 12 hours at a stretch <laughs> might say, well, gee, they're repeating the same programs now that they... But the answer to your question is... It would it's, be it's, less it's, than four it, hours. It's, oh, yeah, it's yeah. going gonna, gonna to be very, very short. We've had longer outages than that because of <laughs> failures of the, of the equipment that's in place oh. over there. Now, the one thing that I'm not sure of is... Uh, how long it's going to take us to get the system built up over at Grass Valley Group and debugged and all of the incoming feeds from Grass Valley City Hall, Nevada City City Hall, and, and the, uh, uh, the Root Center so that we can maintain our, our obligation to broadcast government programs. I, 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 I have a sense that we're probably going to miss one or two programs, but that's not, a, that's not a showstopper because once we do the cut over to Grass Valley Group, it'll be just like we were back in the armory.
that answer your question, Wayne? Yes. Okay, you. good. Are there any other questions for Jay? Yeah. Um, you mentioned that Dave Crow has gone and that arrangement for equipment and due to the studio equipment is who knows where. Is there someone who has taken, who will be the next person who takes up that place for him, or how is that negotiation process going, or what ha is that just a... Well, I got... Bad news and good news. I'm going to give you the bad news first. His replacement in the in the press announcement they made, Perlow's replacement, was characterized as an efficiency expert. So I don't think we're going to see him provide the level of interest and advocacy for us that Perillo did. The good news is, I think a number of you know Lou Dobbins, who's the training manager over at Grass Valley Group. Lou and I have had a number of off-the-record discussions about equipment that he might be able to find for us over there. Mm -hmm. so. Are you the reporter for the union? No? Okay. I just wanted to make sure that anything <laughs> that anything that was said about Grass Valley wouldn't you know, go beyond the... Thank, okay. thank, thank, thank you, Susan. I, I did step over the line there. but uh, uh, No, Dave, Dave and... There was a chemistry between Dave and Paul, and that's gone. You know. They knew each other before Paul even moved here. Yeah. So would that be a situation where fundraising is going to be even more important? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So are there any more questions? Yeah, yeah. questions. <clears throat> so you mentioned that the TriCaster would suffice for live broadcasts? Yes. Mm -hmm. right. So... Is it just not as robust as you'd like, or you want it, we, we would use it for <clears throat> remote live broadcasts? As if if we if we are using it in the studio, we obviously can't be using it out in the field at the same time. But itself doesn't have any like limitations. No, it's it's capable of a very very high level of uh, of production quality. Yeah. 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 So the thing is, the the point is that we can't do remote live broadcasts. If that's not simulta not simultaneously. We we might be able to, and and I'm I'm thinking of it, Robert, as being a short term solution to the fact that we, you know, we got thrown a major curve because of the lack of availability of some new. We were talking about doing a full HD studio, but that's not in the cards anymore. Mm -hmm. And thank you. And as far as I. There seems to be some missing equipment on or equipment on the wish list that we need, and looking at Grass Valley Group as a possible source and other sources. Is there anything that we could be doing or or looking towards other places? Or? But so, yes. In fact, we have a, a short-term plan in place to work closely with Jay and and uh, Carol to evaluate what equipment needs are the backbone that we have to have immediately. And now that the NAB, the National Association of Broadcasters, <coughs> annual meeting is winding down or over uh, in Las Vegas and the video folks two more days. Back in the back <laughs> coming back home with the mentality of we purposely did not approach them before the NAB, knowing how much effort goes into getting ready for that. It's a big sales event for the year. We have a plan in place to reach out to uh, specific companies for specific equipment needs. Uh, very, you know, and we think that there's a really good chance when they see this position as this is our backbone um, uh, being able to support those kinds of things. So we have that process that works and any day now um, we'll be moving out. I think I'll let them get back in town for a few days before yeah. I go there so they can uh, unwind from Las Vegas. Okay, at this point I'm going to turn it back over to Susan just to run through the quick action item. Okay, we have one action item and uh, shall the board change the day and time of its regular monthly board meetings to the third Thursday of every month at 6 p.m. Um, this is the day back to back with Christine on Tuesday. And I think you all know we were trying to start it at 5.30, but now we have two other board members who have meetings up till 5.30, so, so we're looking at third Thursdays at every month at 6 p.m. So. Do I hear a motion to approve the resolution that the board will change the day and time of its regular monthly board meetings to the third Thursday of every month at 6 p.m.? So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? A second. Thank you, 
Interesting. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Okay. Just to let you know, I reserved the Sierra Commons room. Oh, if we need it. okay. Oh, so, uh, I think we'll, tr we, if the studio could, if the studio is ready, we'll probably try and have it there. But if not, the backup location will be the conference room at Sierra Commons. And that will be out for everybody to, uh, wait, uh, probably within, I guess, probably we'd know about two weeks ahead whether the, yeah, okay. So by, by about two weeks from now, we ought to know whether the studio would be ready, and if not, then we'll know that it's Sierra Commons. That will be on the website, and we'll have Terry put it out. Budget report. I'm getting there. <laughs> Let's see. Normally, I do a, a more robust budget report, but um, after moving the, the studio and everything, uh, we haven't had a chance to um, complete the financials that we normally do for the month. Um, we have extra up. copies of this too, yeah. this balance sheet. Yeah. So right now what we have um, is basically a balance sheet as of the end of March showing where we are. Um, we have just over $24,000 in the bank at the end of March. We've got about $7,000 in accounts receivable from um, peg fees that are coming, um, government meeting videotaping services that we had rendered in the prior months. We're down from where we anticipated being due, due to the um, you know, tenant improvement overruns that we have and, and now having to, to double up on rent for a while. Um, but Emma did a great job going through and trying to reduce expenses wherever we could. Um, so it's you know a lot tighter than we wanted, but we're not in any <laughs> dire situation. Um, and then Susan, we scheduled a finance committee for the March thirtieth. Is this May? Is this March? March thirtieth, no. Monday, March thirtieth, April. 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 Yes. <laughs> April thirtieth, 30. Monday at four thirty. Yeah. Uh, to go over more detail, I'll have the rest of the um, finance report done by that time, um, and then we'll go over that. It'll include. Um, Emma's latest budget changes in there so we can see where we are. Um, and just so everybody knows, um, we're on a fiscal year that starts July 1st and runs through June 30th each year. So we're basically coming to the end of our budget cycle in fiscal year. We've already got basically, you know, April on um, this year. And then we do start a new budget process uh, going forward. So. That will be coming up in the next couple of months to, to look at what money we can fundraise, uh, what we can spend, and, and how we're going to move forward. So, are there any questions? Yeah. Uh, how much of that balance is capital money and how much is not? Um, I don't have an exact figure right now. Um, Right now, I think about probably around five thousand dollars is capital, and the balance is operations. And just so you know, a lot of the peg fees we get are capital restricted, just because of the federal law that created peg channels. Um, money that comes in from Comcast, based on the subscriber base, is restricted to only going out and buying equipment. So for a long time before we did this move, we had excess capital, money that we couldn't spend because we didn't necessarily need the equipment and things were running okay. Um, now that we've had these issues come up, capital's down more than we would like, but we have operations money. And operations money can be spent on anything, but capital restricted money has to be spent on, um, on capital assets. So, equipment for the studio, cameras, that kind of thing. Cheryl? I just had a comment that I'm so thankful to have a CPA involved with our organization, Paul. I appreciate yes. what you do for us. How are the salaries paid? Out of operations. 
And is that through fundraising since it's not through capital through Comcast? Yeah, we all, there's there's some um, uh, video fees that we get. We also get some um, government money from the from the city and the county. That's a small amount that comes in. There's also membership fees that pays for that. Um, um, does the board think about increasing the staff? Like you know, you want to increase the equipment. Do you see that as a projection in your budget planning? Right now, we're um, since we're short of staff, especially now. But I mean, but in general. Since, actually, well, since actually, we've been we're trying to staff as much as we can with volunteers on some of these things, and if, and not necessarily have to spend operations money on staff as but much like as in, we can. But like any organization, like Circle, a hospitality house, mm -hmm. they have to have paid staff. You have paid equipment, very expensive equipment. You can't just give that to all volunteers and people go on vacations you need no that's why we have that's why we have a number of wanted. trained staff that know how to work the equipment and everything but there's a lot of stuff um, that other people could do and uh, in a yeah. volunteer basis so um, I feel like this is an issue that's getting a little bit too broad for this conversation and I like to redirect and just I think that budget um, uh, you know really commenting specifically on just the budget report as Paul uh, just laid it out in terms of staffing um, that's a, that's something that's that's that we can talk about maybe after this but staffing is not really a part of this particular conversation so I want to redirect a little bit if that's okay for everybody well it is a part of budget though well, it is a part of our budget, but 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 we can't speak to you know right now. Yeah, staffing issues right now. So, are there any other questions to Paul as related to? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do we know what we expect next year from the pig fees? Um. Next year? Well, we're coming up on a new fiscal year. I don't have that number with me at the moment. Normally, it's different. Don't, it alternates years, right? So oh, yeah, we have. There's, there's a couple grants that we get that, that what Terry's referring to is there's a grant that we get from Comcast that one year is thirty thousand dollars for capital, the next year is fifteen thousand for capital. So this year we got our thirty, which helped cover the, the ten improvement costs. Next year it'll be fifteen, and then we also get an operations grant from um, Suddenlink. And it's ninety-eight hundred dollars every other year, and we're expecting that money to come in in June of this year. Um, but then next year, it's it's nothing. So. Okay. Um, fund development report. Did you did you make a printout of of the, of the base camp thing? No, I sent it to you, and you were going to put you it on did? this. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, Allison is our fund development report chair, and she sent me something this afternoon, and I'm sorry, I just, I forgot it, so I'm going to try and make it, it in my email. Okay, okay you can find it. The internet, the wireless, who doesn't want it? The, um, the fund development committee has been meeting, and she, uh, Allison Lehman is the chair of that. We meet about once a month. She has a four-pronged approach to what we've been doing. We've been looking at fee-for-service, which means how can we increase videography services or any kind of services of any type that we might be able to offer to earn money. And uh, the staff was involved in helping figure out what that would be. I got a little bit involved in it. Basically, we were trying to offer any and all kinds of services that we could. Um, and so that's been in process. There's grant. There's people who've been monitoring grants. Uh, I personally wrote two grant applicators. Actually, Stan Lathrop, our recently resigned board member, uh, did a first comprehensive draft on a small grant, and then I finished it up and mailed it in uh, for a summer camp this this uh, summer. And then I also wrote a small Seroptimus local chapter grant. And if we get that money, that'll go toward editing bays and upgrading uh, some of the equipment in the editing bays that Carolyn has asked for. So those kinds of things are identified and, and tracked and. Uh, like you heard Emma report on the one that she's applying for. Merchant programs is another one of the four prongs. That's the, the SPD community car, the Save Mart car, the online shopping thing, and that sort of thing. They're not huge, but every little bit helps. And can you remember the fourth one? 
Oh, you don't have a report in front of you? No, I just, oh, oh. I had so much going on, okay, I couldn't no, remember it all. Um, I Cheryl, do you remember? The fourth prong? Um, Fee-for-service grants, merchant programs. Underwriting? Yeah, well, that's one of the prongs. You bet. And we, underwriting is behind, I'll be real honest, we're behind on that. Um, Paul was the lead person on that, board members are, have always been and remain available to go with him to speak to underwriters. Uh, I went with him last September, we got $1,000 from a financial advisor in town. I don't know that uh, there were some other leads that he had, James told me that he went to two of those and um, there's more work we need to do there. So I do have her, I did find her. Oh good, thank yeah. you. <laughs> Um, so grants fee for service, merchant rebate, and underwriters and donors. Okay, underwriters and donors. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we worked on in terms of talking about donations is the, the price points that we've had to offer have always been very limited. You can join as an individual for 35, a family for 60, a business for something else, and then there's $1,000 for underwriting. Well, maybe there's somebody who'd be willing to give us $500, but we didn't have a $500 price point for them. So what we have now, and it's, it's on a sheet ready to go, uh, is different, more tiers, more, more sort of price points where people can come in at something, let's say, more than 100, but not 1,000 if they can't do 1,000. So that's my report for Allison. So uh, just to, and I don't have the figures in my mind, but it sounded, from what I heard, uh, potentially within the next few months, we could, if we get the education-related grant, which is a designated gift, um, that was at a uh, twenty-five hundred dollars. Twenty-five hundred if we get it from Seroptimus, which all go toward equipment, and twenty-five hundred if we get the Bessie Minor grant, which was that one that you may have all seen advertised in the paper. A lot of people applied for that, but they give more than one award. And these are designated for yeah for education. But we will get youth. we will get some operational money out of that if we get the summer camp because the summer camp kids will also be paying fees. And so there'll be money coming in from fees from parents wanting their kids to have something to do for two weeks in the summer. And the grant that Emma mentioned was up to nine thousand. Seventy-five hundred. I, I have a question on what isn't there a, a, a couple grants or at least one grant that is a matching funds grant that has to be matched? Uh, in other words, like I don't know if it's the Arts Council. I think it was grant. the C it was the CAC grant. And, and yes. it, I mean, is that is that in this projected? You know, the money that's coming in is is that where that money comes from, or is that the money for the matching grant has to come from fundraising, or does it come from the? We were we were told by Paul that 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 we don't have to raise extra money for that. That it's already within money that we have that's being spent on things. That's what he told us. So that's how a matching grant typically works. You utilize your operations funds to 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 match that. So say there was a ten thousand dollar grant, and you you can you were able to utilize ten thousand dollars of your operating budget to match that project. So you didn't have to specifically fundraise for that oh. particular thing. Uh, any more questions on the fund development? I just I wasn't clear. Was that summer camp at Dunn deal, or are we waiting to hear? No, about that? we're waiting to hear. Both of those will be announced on May first, and I'll probably be meeting with Stan Lathrop. Stan, despite the fact that he, you know resigned a few months early. He's actually retiring himself from the school district, so he's got a lot on his plate. He's, he's retiring from being a teacher. But he's very enthusiastic and he wanted to do this and we'll be meeting in the next couple of weeks because if we get these grants, he'll be, and we're partnering with the Grass Valley School District if this happens. The school district will be letting us use their iPods and their iPads with these kids and, uh, and, and they'll be publicizing, they'll be doing all of the groundwork basically to attract the students and sign them up and that sort of stuff. And I'll be, you know, obviously getting you in the loop on that, so you know, all the staff people, so you know what's going on. Okay, at this point, I think we're going to move to uh, public comment. And so at this time. Madam Chairwoman, I would like to take the lead. And we have a little three person tag team on Paul Minicucci's behalf. Um, Myself, Sam Mills, and Randy Hanson were very succinct and right in the middle of my presentation. Can you identify yourself? I'll, I'll hand you this. Thank you. 
<laughs> yes, in your, in, I tend to be very verbose, so I decided to actually read my part of this. Yeah. Thank you. And then I'll turn it over to Sam. Thank you. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm Larry Lee Holman, and I'm a filmmaker. When Michael Lamarca issued me a contract to produce a 16-part series, Once Upon a Time at the Library, at NCTV, he gave me a key to the premises. That was in early 2009, and since then I've spent many, many hours at the facility and have completed upwards of 30 half an hour and one hour programs. Many of these programs have been as a volunteer and some under contract. When Paul Minicucci took the reins, it was obvious to me that Paul is a visionary with an impressive track record who could lead us in our mission to bump up production quality and content for community access television, develop mentoring programs for our children, lead us forward in communion with our local and world communities, as well as our children, and in developing a successful and effective digital platform. The Digital Media Center, indeed, Paul's creation and work in progress is nothing without Paul. Paul was responsible for procuring the CalArts grant, which is the only grant that the organization received last year. This is our work in progress. I shot it and edited it with my partner, Pinnell Curtis, who is the producer and director. We have a fourth one that is being completed as, we, as I speak. It, it is a grant that needs to have matching funds, and although the message was in front of the board on many, many occasions, no effort was made to fundraise. Paul Minakuchi is a big fish in a small pond, and the minnows have forced him out. This article in the Union is exactly correct. And I have been in the building daily for the last year and have observed and personally witnessed and was privy to on a daily basis for the past year harassing emails and phone calls to Paul. And Paul himself told me about these, the details. I've seen them. Larry, as, the, you, as, the, as the union indicated, Paul was harassed Larry, until he gave up fighting, Larry, but he did, never you resigned. Did have agreements. You Paul did has have agreed agreements. to come back as ED, but he has very strict conditions under which he will accept the job. Larry, now I'll turn it over to you. You did have, a, I just want to remind everybody, please, of the agreements that we had. Right, I'll turn it over to Sam Which now. is that we would, we would be respectful, Thank that you. we would listen as allies, Thanks. Thanks and, not, and no personal attacks, please, using Thanks. I statements. <laughs> We're, we're trying. Uh, hi, I'm Sam Mills, and I've been a camera, volunteer cameraman for four years on the floor at NCTV, and I uh, enjoyed every minute of it. Um, I'm also a major donor, and over that period of time, I've given $14,000 to NCTV uh, through uh, different small grants from the East Bay Community Foundation via Michael Lamarca and Paul. None of those grants uh, have anything to do with the board. Um, <clears throat> because uh, I'm a major donor, uh, you know, I have concerns about the fiscal stability of, of this TV station, of, of the Digital Vision Media Group. Um, I know you have a, a significant deficit, and um, I know that you're, right now you're expenses are outstripping your income and your deficit is expanding. Um, uh, <clears throat> I've, uh, for the last 30 years I've served on uh, several boards and uh, been involved in them in different capacities. Um, I think uh, what, what I'd like to, what, what concerns me about this board is that um, it's emphasis on fundraising really seems to be lacking. And um, uh, I would like to, um, and also um, I've heard concerns about the management style that has been um, a bit uh, micromanaging and um, a bit overbearing, and even I've heard the word harassing. So the lack of um, a uh, consistent and healthy fundraising program regarding the sport and in the culture, I think has contributed to the state that you're in now, which is uh, you, you're really kind of running close to the edge here. Um, so I'd like to make a post 
Um, uh, I've helped a couple of organizations rise from the ashes and, and have prosperous futures. And it was partly timing and gifting at a time, crucial time, but it was also having a really uh, uh, consistent team to work with both on the board and staff. Um, I, um, because I'm such a fan of Paul's and have worked with him for these years uh, filming on the show and just I've been impressed with what he's done with NCTP, his vision, how well he's cobbled this, this move and everything, um, I've, I've been disturbed by his sudden disappearance, as it were. So I have a proposal I'm going to make. Um, I'm prepared to give $25,000 to this organization like as soon as next week with another $25,000 to come six months from now. The first $25,000 uh, $25, is to help facilitate the move. And then the second $25,000 would be, to, after it's up and running again, to help push it forward. I'd also be willing to be involved with any kind of development team that comes into place that uh, really wants to deepen the culture of development on the board and in the community. And I've already been doing some work with uh, Penelope and Larry regarding that. Um, but I do have two conditions. One. I want to see Paul back in here. I feel that you can't remove a surgeon in the middle of an operation, and I feel like he deserves an opportunity to complete the job he started. So that's one condition is that Paul be reinstated as executive director immediately, and also that the board leadership, uh, not the, the board, but the board leadership, uh, acknowledge their failure to raise the necessary funds which has led us to this situation and that they step down so that new volunteers from the NCTV community come in and reinvigorate the board and recalibrate it to more of a de developmental approach. So those are my two conditions and I'm ready to uh, negotiate with you at any time. Thank you. Okay. Is there a third person on the tag team before we respond? Randy. Yeah, that was me. Randy Hanson. <laughs> well, first off, uh, everybody here pretty much knows who I am. I'm Randy Hanson. I, I, I do the local news on G, GBTV News on the station. And um, I've worked at the station for about the last year uh, as the special events coordinator. Uh, the, the first uh, big project that I brought up was Thursday Night Markets, and uh, that was uh, supposed to be a 10-week deal. Uh, due to the fact that one of the weeks is the four, uh, Fourth of July, uh, no, wait a minute. Well, yeah, I think it's Fourth of July. That nobody uh, the fair. I'm sorry. One of the weeks, the fair, nobody goes to to Thursday Night Market, so we skipped that. And then one week we absolutely just had a, a meltdown. We were supposed to have board members as guests, and I don't know what happened, but we just didn't even have anybody to have a guest, so we only did eight shows. Out of the eight shows, uh, we had decided that each week we would have a table there. Where uh, And since we started off with the idea of 10, and at the time I think we had 10 board members, and so the idea was is that each week one of the board members, a different one, would be at that table, they would be able to meet the public, they'd be able to tell everybody about that we have a digital, uh, you can get us on the internet, because most people in the community, when you say Channel 11, they say, I don't have Comcast, and so, they don't watch it, because I, they don't know. I don't, I don't mean to interrupt you, Randy, but we, want to, we, we need to be, we have to be aware of the time. And He's less than three minutes. What? That, no, I, no, I know, but the, uh, what I'm saying is, if, we, if you could try to get to your focus points, that would be really helpful. Well, I can skip all the way to closing. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll read it, okay? Because that way, you know, that then I won't get off track and Thanks. waste any time. I appreciate that. Many of us feel that 
there are certain board members that have conflicts of interest in the being on the board. Part of it is due to the fact that they might have to wear many hats. They're maybe on other boards. And I know for a fact, I was at a board meeting when, when Trent first came on board, and, and he even mentioned that he couldn't raise funds because it would be a conflict with his Sarah Commons uh, position. And it was sort of like to do two different, it just doesn't work. So because of the other things that he has to offer the organization, that was sort of like a waiver, you know, that, okay, he didn't have to do that. Uh, I think Allison Lehman, uh, because of her governmental position, is sort of in a position where it's really hard for her to be a fundraiser. And 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 I, I don't think that's really something that, that that is a big help for this organization. Um, and uh, Susan, I've known you for a long, long time, and I know, uh, and you know, I know we're not supposed to be personal, but I'm mean, saying I, I appreciate, you, you know, I know you do a lot of hard work and everything, but I think that because of the the whatever the friction was between the the Paul Menacucci, uh, uh you know, his his situation here, and and with the board, which is basically, I think, a friction between you and him more than the other people on the board, is that, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, Paul is really the most important cog of the wheel in this organization. And, and it was Paul's ideas that even brought us to the point of even going to Grass Valley Group. It was Paul's entire, uh, uh, all his contacts, and even from out of the, this community, from bringing people in from the state and, and other places, and, and what he could offer us. And to let him go at this point is just it's mind-boggling to me. And and I know that Emma stepped in and you know is a real trooper. I mean she just got here and she's already you know right in there trying to do what she can. But I I really do believe that uh, that you guys should think about you know the uh, the whole thing you know and. Um, before you know, we make any other decisions. That's something that, you know, for me, I will always support uh, public access. It doesn't matter what it is, and uh, and I think everybody here, if the people in this room want to raise funds in the future and help and do more and an open transparency, that you know we can do many more things. Thanks, Andy. So, I'm just wondering, how long has it been? Five years. Five years. I've never met you. I'm just wondering. In fact, all the board members, uh, my husband is Claude Head Gates Very Hines. Claude Hopper's, I think, from our eighth season. Oh, right. Our eighth season. Good. And um, it's been great. But I don't think I've even met anybody on the board. And I was just curious as to why no one ever comes over and says howdy. I mean, I mean, uh, We'll all be meeting each other more. I'm glad we're here and seeing some faces. And it's nice to meet you all. Nice to meet you too. Me too. I think I was at a couple producers' potlucks and tried to meet people. Oh, maybe we just missed each other. Okay, we'll see you meet you in a little bit. Nice to meet you as well. I can respond to that. At what point are we going to? Pardon? At what point are we going to respond to some of the points? We're, we're not going to. Just, not right now. We have we have okay. a few minutes left, and I want to be able to make sure that everybody can be heard first. I think that's okay. that's important. Adele. Okay. I am Adele Taylor, and I'm a producer, and I've produced a lot of films. I've been here since Elcat in 1992, and I started out by better by videotaping veterans um, because I had a, a veteran who called me up and who wanted to know about can I turn on my camera. So I've been a person who's gone out. I haven't used the studio quite so much, but I really believe in free speech. I believe in public access, and it's a valuable tool for our community. And I really feel that it's a, a resource and um, that hasn't been honored by our board. And I'll take you back to Michael Marka, because this was a change when you came in here, um, Susan. I was helping Michael Marka raise funds going out to outreach to do what we are talking about is underwriting, also trying to raise the membership quota. He was had, there was some things that came up in his life and, and 
Once again, this is another question that I have about the board because this was a good man, another executive director, that it left under circumstances that are questionable. I'm All, just a second. Just the same way that there are circumstances that seem questionable around Paul. I think part that of that is relevant. No, because I do have to address this. This is Adele, true. Adele, I do believe that this is irrelevant because most of the people who are sitting on the board now were not here during the time. But this, Michael but the board here. has been here for the last year when you've been doing fundraising, and over two years ago when I was doing fundraising, and we put together a packet where we had DVD on how to go out and make the pitch. We had a price list on how to go out to the community for the outreach. We had everything organized. And you're telling me just a year later, just in, within the last year, you're starting to do um, development on fundraising. I want to say that should have been happening way back when, uh, when, when the ball was dropped in with, with Michael Marka. So I want to ask the board, what is, why are you on the board if not to use your clout and your money and your prestige to bring in either more membership, to bring in more underwriting, basically, and to help us keep a location. Where's the money? Where's the location? And I'm really disappointed because I don't feel that there has been fundraising that has, has taken place here by the board. Thank you for your comment, Gil. <clears throat> I think Adele brings up one point that, you know, respectfully, to comment to you about how the board wasn't here. <clears throat> and it brings up an underlying uh, fact. When you look back at the history since 1992, when Adele was on, 97, when I came on board, that we've had many boards, many board members. But one thing that has stayed true it's the commitment of the producers that you see in the room here today. The commitment of those producers which is taking time to come out here today, tonight, to meet and get to know everybody on this board. Now where are you going to be in three years, five years, who knows? If you're still going to be on the board. But I think what you're going to see is the core group of producers. It's still going to be remaining here. And that's the essence. Uh, we need to join you in leadership, not be ruled by you. And that way we can accomplish many more things. So I know this board wasn't here, wasn't in charge of Michael and Marka, but there's some historic things that I think have to be looked at. Thank you, that's a great comment. Yeah. Wait. Hi, I'd just like to introduce myself. <laughs> I'm um, Wade Amesbury, I've been uh, part of NCTV since I was at Gilmore in 2003-2004. I was under Stan Lathrop in his media class. He was brilliant. He inspired me amazingly. I would just like to say, like, thanks to this whole community, I know things about video. I can use a camera. I can confidently go into Final Cut Pro and be like, well, if I get lost, I'll find the manual. Anyways, I just wanted to say, or ask a few questions about what's been going on here. Because, you know, I have, I, I've been here since like 2003, 2004. I've never seen any of you people before. I know the board has changed a bit. Like, but why, why, why haven't I seen anyone? I mean, I've been, I've been intermittently back and forth, you know, going to school and whatnot. But, um, also, um... It seemed as though, Susan, Susan um, you did not have an adequate amount of time to prepare for this meeting, possibly. You I said you were very busy today, and, and you... Preparing you, for the meeting. Yeah, so you didn't, you, didn't, you didn't allocate a certain amount of time I, I, I think prior to the meeting. I think that Why that's, isn't Wade, it... Can, can we... Can I'm, we agree, I'm getting tired questions. You know, can we agree to go that we're listening? Yes, like just, that's just, the truth. I'm, I'm asking I, I, I a don't question. Know that, of, we, can't, we, we can't say what... <laughs> I, I, I think everybody. I think everybody needs to take a breath for a second, and I'm going to intervene, and then and then we'll and then okay. I'll let you go. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank okay. You. Can I? Okay. Thanks. I just, May I finish my question? Thoughts, just don't. Yeah. Hold okay. on to it. Okay. okay. One of the things I want to stay away from again are, are, per, are personal attacks on indeed. on people. indeed. And I am just pointing out a circumstance that came up in this specific meeting earlier. 
She said on her computer, you guys don't have Wi-Fi, you guys obviously know that. Why didn't she have that email loaded? She was, uh, well... She was busy, yeah, right? Yeah, Why she, isn't there time she, outside the meetings for you guys binder, to... I was making this binder. I will, I I will read those and binder. look at those in a moment. And okay, I'm okay. so glad okay, you wait, brought them. Wait, 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 we're still... Um, but um, I'm just unsure why isn't it regulation for you guys to have homework. We do. Or come to the station <laughs> once again. We have homework. Like, we, everyone here does homework, goes to the station, because participates in their free time. You know, I think... You guys are just dedicated here? Yeah, no, I think... Really? I think this is a is really good... Is that all good, for you guys? I think this is a really good topic. I'm going to go back to... Thank you. ...to what I, I what I talked about with Gil, which is that this is a first step. This is not the end. This is not the end all and not the be all. Now, obviously, there needs to be some, some more communication that comes out of this. And, you know, as Gil and I were talking earlier today, maybe another forum, a different type of forum, this is a board meeting, and we need to run it as a board meeting. We need to keep to our agreements. Mm -hmm. And we're only, we're taking the first step in establishing what I hope would be better communication. But, so I, I, I really... And possibly think. more regulations upon the board to participate more closely with the members. Well, I think that <laughs> So um, at this point, I'd just like to remind everybody that it is four minutes past eight, and we did agree to, to end the meeting at eight o'clock. We did? I didn't agree. I didn't agree. No. We didn't agree. Okay. First off, we didn't agree. There was no agreement up there. Well, and you said well, everybody in the room would be out there in three minutes, right? Uh, how five, about this? I'm going, then I'm going, to take, I'm going to take the pulse of the room. And then we have to have an agreement about how long we're going to stay because some of us do have families and commitments at home. Gil. Um, before you take the pulse of the room, uh, might be advantageous to close your board meeting. And then we can have the kind of discussion that may be necessary or, or maybe not. And that way the board is, if, if you have family commitments, certainly understand that and everything like that. But. Uh, that this is what I was telling you about this the board the formality is is not conducive to um, all of the dis excuse me all of the discussions that that mm -hmm. we may need to and this is just the beginning I which right. I which I agree with you but beginning or not uh, it might be something that benefits everybody so that's just one suggestion okay I'm I'm willing to stay here for until 8:30 to facilitate. I, I think that's a great I think that's a great suggestion and I'm interested and I would look at that I personally am willing to stay here until 8:30 and mm -hmm. no later than that however I do have to respect that everybody else has has commitments mm -hmm. and and this is way beyond you know what a normal board meeting would be would be like Terry. Um, I just want to say I, I think your suggestion is a good one to maybe go you know close the board meeting and whatnot. But I just have to tell you that I understand that you're really trying to regulate and keep the agreements and everything, and I appreciate that. But just from the volume of emails that I've gotten and phone calls that I've gotten from people that I haven't heard from in years, I have to tell you that this is, I've been with the organization since 1999, and this is the most involved, concerned, aware, afraid, you name it, it's out there. Like I say, people I haven't heard from in years is, what's going on, Terry? And I'm like, well, come to the meeting and you know have some open dialogue. Mm -hmm. So I caution you against trying to control it so much that you will not get an accurate picture of what people really feel yeah. in their hearts, and they're going to leave here like frustrated. I'm not. I'm That's not interested. I'm not interested in controlling the meeting. I am a facilitator, and a facilitator tries to stay as neutral as possible. What I'm trying to do is respect our time. We are here. We've already been here for over two hours now, and some people, as I said, some of my board I know have have young children, and you know, a lot of us are are are, are we're all working professionals as well. So I, I just need to be able to say, is it, we could have some agreement that we could say a little bit. Would you well, mind very briefly, briefly uh, saying something about that? There are two dynamics in play in California. One is the California Constitution. It has the strongest language <coughs> of any state on personal privacy. In fact, many states don't deal with it at all in their constitution. So all of us here enjoy a right to privacy unless there's some specific governmental overriding need not to have that privacy. This is why you can't walk up to your neighbor and have your tape recorder going, et 
it's a violation of law to take even a personal conversation without telling your neighbor you're doing it first and they decide whether they want to participate with you. If I can interrupt, okay. the public person does, does lose that right. If you're a public name, you can't. Not a public name, a, a public official. There are different right. rules for elected officials. You're right. But among those of us who aren't elected officials, um, we all have, and actually they have a, a privacy protection when it's outside the domain of the office they hold. Okay. The other is um, a series of employment laws that have been on the books in California for many years now that talk very specifically based upon that constitutional privacy dynamic. They talk very specifically about not, in fact, engaging for employers of any sort, for-profit, non-profit, of government, of not engaging in personnel discussions of individuals. You could talk about a general salary program, or do we extend a certain type of health benefit to a large group of people, or whatever. But when it comes to individuals, that is protected. The only way you can talk about an individual is that individual shows up and says, I waive my right, you can talk about it. But no one else can waive that individual's right. So when you get into individual discussions or want to, if it involves anything to do with their employment, with their pay, with their benefits, with their job assignments, with their performance, all of that is literally outside, based upon California statute, is outside the domain of discussions in a general form. That's why every board, even those that have to disclose other things to the public, they go into executive session to talk about collective bargaining negotiations, to talk about lease negotiations, to talk about HR issues. That's all done in closed session because of that protection that's there. Thank you, Bill. So it's the people who are here supporting Paul to say they support him, but there can be no discussion That's about right. it. Absolutely. Under a board meeting, is that what you're saying? But if we start our own meeting or had our own general discussion, it would be okay and no one would get in trouble? No. Under a board meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Paul, Paul, would Paul would have to agree to it. I mean, okay. Okay. He, you know, if, if you're the person at the center of the discussion, in some ways you'd like to be able to say, yeah, but in others, once you say, yeah, the discussion can get away from you in every direction, too. So, general, but Paul would have to be here and say, it's fine, say whatever you want. Yes. Uh, Paul has a very impressive CV when it comes to government service, participation in nonprofits, and also within the California State Legislature. He would absolutely agree with this gentleman here. And he wouldn't want anybody, I don't believe, in my opinion, to do anything outside that. Uh, he's... Uh, in every way, uh, fully cognizant and uh, a very uh, knowledgeable and, and confident person on this level about these things. So I think we agree with you completely. And I think that kind of puts a, uh, an envelope on, on the discussion. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Next, we have anybody else? Wow. We... Who is that guy? I'm Anthony Stewart. <laughs> He's a camera guy. I'm a camera guy. Yes. <laughs> Excuse me. Wait. Oh, can you stand up, sir, and yeah. identify yourself? Uh, my name is Jerry Martin, Thank and you. I'm a local producer, and I've been involved with NCTV well since the FCAT days in 1997. Not so much recently because I produced my own show outside of the station, and I just dropped by a DVD. But anyway, that's not what, this is what I want to ask about. Um, I see here that um, the board is not required to operate under the the uh, dictates of the Brown Act, and that may well be, I'm not disputing that, but I would like to open up some discussion about whether or not it would be advisable, whether this would be a good thing, whether the board should operate under the Brown Act, because I know quite a few other, quite a few people are disappointed that there are things going on um, that we don't know what's, what's happening, and if, if the board were more open and more accountable, by operating under the Brown Act, I think you'd, you'd uh, solve a few of the problems that now exist because it, it looks kind of almost looks like the board operates semi-secretly and, and people are a little bit put off by that. So I would like to have some discussion, pro and con, and I don't know the details. I don't know which side I would argue on. 
but but somehow or other we've gotten away from the Brown Act, and maybe maybe it would be advisable, even if even though you're not required to, maybe we would be better off if we did operate under the Brown Act. Thank you for, for that comment. I have a question. Just because we don't operate under the Brown Act or we're not operating under the Brown Act doesn't mean that we can't adopt a certain Brown Act activities yeah. in the function of the station and therefore communication between each other. Uh, the, the minutes and the things that you printed out today, Susan, thank you for doing that. Obviously, that was something that should have been done you know, in the past or as you were going and everything. But you know what? It's done. It's done now. They're here for inspection, the, the posting of the agendas, the, the sending an email out that there's a board meeting. This is the first board meeting that I've even heard of in four years of when it was time. And, and like Terry said, the outpouring of email activity and the rallying of the membership which you serve, you serve the membership. And that just can't be overstated enough that everybody on the board understand that. It's not that we serve you. The board serves the membership and the entity that is NCTV and community television here in Nevada County. So we could adapt things, and I think the board should quickly do that like they did today, having an agenda, letting people know, those are all good positive steps in, in adapting some of those rules. So, I just wanted to add to your comments that, and again, I don't say this because I'm a lawyer, but you never want to try to come under a law that you're not covered by because <laughs> <laughs> later on you want to enforce something. You know, when you're in a court, the judge said, no, you're not covered by this law. What you can do, and many corporations do this, nonprofit as well as some profit, is they do adopt a series of, of uh, policies. An umbrella policy is on transparency, and then they adopt a number of subsets from there. And so that's their operating rules for that for yeah. company, for that corporation, whether it's, again, for profit or non profit. So you can approach it the same way as the Brown Act, but you know, using some of the principles, if you see fit as an organization, but you do it under policy. Just don't call it a brown act. No, that's right. Can I, can I uh, one thing? Wait, hang on just can a second. I, can wait, I, I think I need some of the brown Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Just, just a second, everybody. Okay. Randy and then Susan. Thank you. Uh, and then I, I, I actually disagree with your uh, yellow sheet of paper there saying that you do not qualify or you do not have to operate under the brown act. Uh, from what I understand, is that since the, 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 it's a federal mandate that through the Comcast contracts and the monies that, you know, in every county has the public access and every county has to have open, free, uh, non-commercial uh, ways to submit out and things like that, that that money is, is coming through a federal situation where even though you're just, a, you're a 501c3, it's, that you are still required to act, act under the Brown Act because of that, because of that funding. It's, it's a federal funding. Any federal funding group has to act under the Brown Act, and there's, there is precedent on that. And in fact, I think, I don't know how many people were here back in the, the, uh, the, the days of an issue about the Brown Act before. That was that, If you guys remember that, that with the Buck Stovall thing, that, 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 you know, there, at that time, yes, you said, yes, we're under the people, we're acting under the Brown Act, even though at, at first the board had said they didn't think they had to. But, um, so I think you might want to look a little closer at that, because you might have to act under that Brown Act. Okay. Susan? Uh, just specifically to that, the, I would be very surprised if any kind of federal thing about that could usurp a state thing such as the Brown Act. But if you can find any documentation on that, bring it to us. Yeah, I have four, I, yeah there's a there's a uh, president online about it, so I, I can. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> and then you know I agree with Bill, and I think Gil, you were here, Jerry. I don't know if you were here when I said that we're going to be putting we're going to be adopting you know a lot of the things that the Brown Act says as policy. 
putting stuff on the website, putting stuff out there, you know, the agendas, putting them all out ahead of time. There are some things that are very clunky and difficult about the Brown Act, like having to scotch tape the agenda to the window of where you're going to be three days ahead. And once you post that agenda publicly, you can't change it. I would not have been able to change the public comment section and move it to the end at the last minute like I did if we were forced to operate under the Brown Act. So, so it kind of makes it harder. Um, I'm sorry that you didn't know we were having board meetings for the last four years. <laughs> this group's been meeting, you know, this, this, the entity has had a board. It's like so totally not secret, everybody. You know, it's like everybody could have just come. But, yeah. but and in the past, there have been situations where people came for a while. And then they got bored because, frankly, these meetings generally aren't very boring. Exciting. The O-R-E-D. Yeah, but they could have also come to the station and met us and could have gotten more involved. Um, but I just excuse, want to Adele, know Adele, Adele excuse me, excuse me, everybody, excuse sorry, me. Advertising for these we're, moving, we're moving into that, that space we don't want to go to. And I just want to remind everybody we have... Us. No, there was there was an, an attack there. Mm -hmm. um, this gentleman yeah, here. I'm Bill Gann. I'm the producer. I've been working with Adele for 15 years. I'm doing this together. And um, I totally agree with what this bill said. Uh, well, my background is uh, I have a long history in, in the public sector. My, I have a master's in public administration, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, I worked for NID for years, retired. I worked in the, with nonprofits, the Nevada County Poultry Series, for almost 20 years. And we're 501c3, very successful in the community, and we thank everybody for their support. Uh, but uh, in reading through this thing here, briefly, to me from the Center of Nonprofit Leadership, it kind of sounds like the board is applying some of this, but picking and choosing as they as they see fit. And I don't see where this really has a lot of value to much. And, and I would call the uh, Center for Nonprofit Leadership on account because of this. As this young man said, what's going on? People aren't doing homework. Well, in number two here, it says self-preparation allows the board to provide continuity of the organization required for success and survival. <coughs> there you go. The wrong thing here says they're supposed to. And then... On the back here, it says, it talks about um, the board's responsibility truly not being the board's responsibility. It says that the board has the responsibility to set policy, I agree. And it also says that the board has the responsibility to uh, manage the staff, which I don't agree entirely. Because which board member does that? What are there, nine of you, 13 of you? You know, how is staff supposed to respond to that? They're not. The idea in the public sector, in which we are, we're pseudo-public sector entity, okay? The idea is for our board of directors to set and fund policy. That's it. And then to review that this policy has been successful periodically. And then the axiom is, with, as far as staff is concerned, it is your job as the board to make sure the right thing gets done and it's the staff's job to make sure that things get done right okay just that simple it's not complicated this is rocket science so there seems to be concern on who's kind of controlling who who in fact is bullying who and why this is happening and one of the issues I have concern about right now is we've had We've had an outstanding officer, author from Sam Mills to contribute a large chunk of money, which would help us be successful in what some of these policies are. And I haven't heard the board say anything about how this is going to be addressed. And in the future, on this type of issue, until this is off the board, Sam's uh, concerns and offer, I would lend my support to Sam Mills and offer that Sam Mills can speak to me for me on any of these issues that come up and arise until these issues are settled. And I thank you guys for your time. Thanks. Bill, would you mind speaking from just one one or two minutes here to the concept of the staff and the board relationship, as particularly as it pertains to an executive director? I think there's some well, confusion. Well, CNL's mission is to 
work with all of our nonprofits in the community. Um, Fifty-four of our nonprofits are members of CNL. There are others that come to our, our training and workshops. And if you look, you see these stories of about 450 nonprofits in the community. And if you really boil it down and you take <coughs> nonprofits that are basically faith-based organizations out of that 450, and you take uh, booster clubs for the high school athletics or the PTA, you take those out of that 450, homeowners associations out of that, you come down to our universe of nonprofits having missions in the traditional 501c3 uh, genre to be about 100, 110. And we, from what we can tell at CNL, um, have all of the larger nonprofits of that 150 and the 54, I mean the 110, 115, in the 54 we have. And I gotta tell you folks, and CNL is in the same category, it's terribly frustrating for all of the boards of all of these organizations because they have to be working boards way beyond helping with some fundraising because they're they're not none of them are large enough. Even the larger ones, like the Friendship Club or Big Brothers or Big Sisters or Hospitality House, they may have five, six employees. But their boards are working boards, the Center for the Arts, uh, on and on. I mean, all of them. And you're no different. KVMR. Everybody in this community, because these organizations are so small. Now, you get up, I sat for seven years on the board of the Sierra Family Medical Clinic. And that grew to, uh, when I left uh, a few years ago, after seven years, they were crowding a million dollars a year in business activity. <clears throat> they had 30 some employees. It was the first time up here that I had been on a board where I could come to a board meeting and just address governance issues, major priorities, take a look at the budget, you know, ask the director of fund development how things were going and what their report was all about, and go home. Now, in my background, I was brought in when somebody maybe wanted to give or sell their individual medical practice to the clinic because they were moving out of, out of town and retiring. That was a very different situation. But we had a more traditional board, and I've sat on national boards where, once again, you have plenty of staff to do the work and you do the governance. But who controls the staff, the executive director? Right? The staff, the, the unless it, there is something different in the bylaws of the organization, the staff is generally managed by the ED, and the ED is managed by the board. Okay. And who raises the funds? And then it, it varies from organization to organization as to whether that is the president of the board solely who manages the ED, or is it an executive? <coughs> and who is the fundraiser? The board? Isn't that the fundraiser? I can fundraiser tell you the rule of thumb up here, if you were to ask... Or in general. In general, in small organizations like this one is, like Center for Nonprofit, all the rest I've talked about in this county, every ED is every bit a fundraiser along with the board. In other words, it comes with the territory and you can go out and call it in yourself. They spend an inordinate amount of their time, besides the operations, setting up the fundraising. And fundraising folks, and again, I was kind of new to to the, the guts of fundraising until about five, six years ago. It's building relationships. So there's just so many philanthropists in this town. So that's a large on part everybody's of list. So you're saying that's a large part of what the board does is fundraising and setting it policy. It does, but the counterbalance of that is if the board is out as volunteers helping in the day-to-day -day management of the organization because there isn't enough staff, because there isn't enough budget, then you get into this you know, how many balls can we all keep in the air? I'm not making a defense for this board. I'm just saying the reality of every small organization up here is the board is expected to spend a significant amount of their time helping the organization and the ED manage the place. Now, that doesn't mean that they should be in there making assignments to individual employees. But if you have agreed with the ED that you're going to kind of honcho this so the ED can do that, and that means that you're going to interface with an employee, then you're technically, you're not their supervisor, but you're helping them as kind of a group 
leader to get the job done, whatever the assignment is. What the is board members think that. I'm trying to set the executive director. Okay, and I'm trying to understand the game here a little bit. Are your capacity? Are you the civil litigation attorney for boards in general? No, no, no. I, in the back no, are you? That, that's my former life, being a lawyer. And so you're here in the capacity of the board, or you're just here? In the no, I'm just an interested party, and and uh, maybe it isn't talking. so so obvious, but. Uh, NCTV or the Digital Center is a one of our 54 organizations. Our being and, uh, Center for Nonprofit non non Leadership. Center for Thank And I guess when I saw when I saw the newspaper article the other day, I thought, okay, okay, it's probably worth coming by and seeing what's going on. <laughs> in, in, in the one thing I, you know, I, um, that I want to say too that in many organizations in Nevada County, um, you know, really fund development is staff. It's, it's staff driven and board and the board helps so basically it's a staff driven and the board helps because the staff has to be able to create the fund development plan so whether there's a fund development director or an executive director and that's what Bill is saying that a lot of the executive directors my, myself being one of them that's a huge part of my job actually is fund development just to just so that you can kind of understand you know how much of my time is spent in fund development it's a whole lot of time that's spent in fund development so it, it is a staff driven and board and the board helps in that capacity yeah I'm Pamela Borman and I've been involved with community access since FCAT 1992 and um, I've done a show for quite a few years on animal rescue and um, I could say probably a good probably 14 to 15 maybe even 20 years um, the thing that I wanted to say is I was involved in the Tele Awards. The, uh, I don't remember what year it was that we had the Tele Awards, where the producers were given um, awards, basically, for doing what they do to encourage more shows to come on the air. At that time, we did raise $4,000 with this. We did an auction and all that. And it involved the board of directors and the producers in raising that funding. And then there was a dinner and a lot of things got donated. So there are many different ideas where everyone can be involved in fundraising, but it does take the board to get that driven. And um, that's basically why that happened. Is uh, I think Lou Sitzer was very involved in that as the executive director at that time. I don't remember who was on the board at that time, but to be honest with you, now that I think about it, I don't think they were even involved at all. You don't think the board was involved? No, no. I that it was Lou's that. idea? No. Uh -uh. So, so much fun, it was great. Yeah, it was a lot of fun, and it was it was really really went well. So what I just want to share is there's ways of incorporating the board with the producers to raise funding and encourage people out in the community to come on board and do programs, and it is an outreach. That's great. I'm, I'm but I was told also that you can't do fundraising with with the with the event that I that I did encourage. But actually, money was made doing that, four thousand dollars. So mm. it's it's a lot of fun to do, and that's what I recommend maybe in the future because I'd like to see more of the producers get recognized for the hard work that they do okay. in producing the programs because it is hard work. Thanks, Emma. Can I just ask a point of clarification? Were you saying that Lucitzer, as the executive director, was one of the people then sort of powering through that? Well, okay. we yes, we had meetings with the, with him, and also Susan Rogers was at some of the meetings, but I don't think she was directly involved with... I don't... I think you were. I can't remember. I, my at event, that time. Yeah. This was the thing at the Odd Fellows? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that was yeah. a nice event. Yeah. 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 So, you know, it's something maybe anybody wants to think about again and then videotaping it. It's just a really good thing and you, you raise funding at the same time. It's a lottery. It was really good for the Oh, it, it was, was great. Everyone together. It was yeah. really fun. So, so just like, we, Terry, and then we do need to close. Okay, well, I'm, I just I have to reiterate again how inundated and how completely mentally and emotionally and spiritually exhausted I am mm -hmm. from the last couple of weeks of just getting slammed with questions and people with concerns, valid concerns. And I'm not, you know, trying to just be, you know, come to the meeting and get your voices out. There's a few people that couldn't come tonight and wanted me to be sure to ask a couple of questions. So don't shoot the message bearer. I'm just going to ask a couple of questions. And there's, you know, there's this, several people have been involved in wanting a petition, and you're probably aware of that. And then 
I've heard from other people that think that's not a good idea, and there's just a lot of valid questions and concerns that they have. And a couple of the things that people have asked me to ask are on that list. So I'm just going to ask a couple of questions. And one is, how are board members selected or elected, and should the bylaws be changed to create a voting membership, and who has the final say on who is on the board? So just, uh, it, that's just too yeah. big of a question. But that's, I feel like, yeah, yeah so but we need, just, this is a really good, I mean, I'm glad you're airing these. And I, yeah, I think, you know. I was just going to say it's a, it's a question to be answered. Yeah, in the future. Yeah, in yeah. The future. So I'm, just, I'm not sure. expecting the answer. Now. Okay, I'm great. Asking it. And then, uh, again, like the same thing, who made the choice to elect, but uh, to not elect, but appoint board members and when. So when you guys are putting out your emails, you know, updates, those might be some things that people are wanting to know. And then the other thing is more um, solution oriented. And that was um, that they wanted to strongly suggest that the board have an advisory committee that will act as a watchdog group to assure transparency of board actions and assist in moving the DMC forward with strong support from the membership and the community at large. Thanks. So I'm sorry, everybody, but we do have to wrap it up. We're, we're over already. What I'd like to do is try to uh, come up with some next step. And, and that's that's complicated given this group. Um, um, so we move that those questions be put on the agenda tonight. Right, right. That, that's a, that's what I'm saying. I, I want to be able to provide a forum where we can really address some of these. And um, do you think we might address some in writing? Because there's just some factual things that could be probably addressed in a written response, mm -hmm. possibly. Well, how do you all feel about that? How do you feel about a written response to some of the questions that you posed? Would that be a good next step? You kind of lose something in writing, but we could do it. I mean, just because getting all these people together in a room is 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 complicated for sure. Um, Gil and then Adam. I would like to see something be done before the next month. Yeah. Oh, sure. Because yeah. it's on the front burner right now. Yeah. And whether we come to the board meeting, which is formal, or you guys go to the studio, which is informal, that's where the real nuts and bolts of getting to know each other, getting to understand each other, communicating, being involved with what you're doing, with what the studio is doing, that's where that rubber meets the road. And, you know, the, uh, the formalities and, and, and written things and everything. I mean, I'm not, there's a place for all of that, and then there's a place for not that. So I think if, what we might want to do is turn the, uh, you know, what we want to do next into when can we get together next. And it doesn't have to be the whole board. It could just be the board that wants to show up, or not all the members, but the members that want to show up. And that way, um, when we had our little impromptu meeting at Sierra Coffee Roasters, um, we didn't necessarily list all the conditions of talking there, but and, and at times it was a little messy. But it was, I think, overall the whole group that was there was very good at uh, self-controlling, letting everybody talk, pointing to, oh, well, we haven't heard from you yet. What do you have to say? And you haven't said anything. Yes, people might have you know, raised their voice and they might have been uh, passionate. People are, okay? So that is a much better form, I think, now that we've taken this first step, that the board is aware that the membership is, uh, wants to get to know them better and wants to work with them in a more cohesive fashion. That might be a next step that we can consider and, and get a place, whether it's here at Coffee Roasters or, or here in this room or uh, you know, some place where we can and have an honest dialogue um, and give and take back and forth. Great, thanks, Adam. Pretty much the same thing. I think most of the big turnout here is due to a all-around desire for more engagement, more direct dialogue. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bill. Did you have something else? Yeah, I, I'm of the opinion that, and Bill touched on it just briefly, in that. Um, you know, I don't know what the heck this stuff is. Is, is this in the bylaws? So uh, I'm not no, sure what you're referring it means to. Nothing. No, no. Those documents were were for people who are interested in producers. We want to get some producers on the board. Those mm -hmm. are to inform 
producers what the typical responsibilities are and then look at some of the things on the board. It would seem that if you're handing these around telling people that this is the way we would like you to act, we would assume that you would act the same way. And, I, and again, if these aren't in the bylaws, I don't see where they have any value. And are the, by, are the bylaws available? Right. Yep, they're here. Uh, they're here somewhere. <laughs> and I'm going to put them on the website. Online? They will be live tomorrow. I think I can get them online. Drupal's a little difficult. I'll do the best I can. I can get Chip Carmen to help me. Where they'll, they'll be at uh, the County TV? Yeah. Emma's going to take this back with her. And anybody who wants to come in and look at these things, they're, they'll be there. And, then, and yeah. you say they will be online tomorrow? Yes. Okay. Yeah. You got, you know, I'm getting the impression here that, that, that there's a lot of confusion because what do the bylaws say about a lot of this behavior that we're concerned about? Mm -hmm. So. Um, I think once we can lead to that, maybe an issue here that, that, that the bylaws need to be readdressed at some point to change those needs uh, to upgrade the community's needs. The, 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 bylaws, community. the bylaws were created by Paul Minacucci and Judy Nielsen and me, and I'm the person who typed all the iterations in the drafts. Were they ever sent out to the membership for approval? I don't ever remember. That would have been Paul's responsibility. I never, I never even... So can we, um, Robert made a good suggestion that we actually close the meeting at this yeah. point, and okay. I think that that would be okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, will somebody be active in trying to set up another meeting? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's not close it until we set. Uh, I think we're going to close the meeting, then we'll, and then we'll move forward into, I, we're still, I'm still standing. <laughs> I know. <laughs> still here. Barely. Barely. Meeting adjourned at I'm still standing. Yeah. Meeting adjourned at 8.42 p.m. Thank you, Susan. Some people who think that's the gavel.